Internet, Metaverse, and Web3. La décennie numérique, l'Europe a défini une... Oui. Merci.
4CH, Competence Center for the Conservation of Cultural Heritage. The 4CH project is the first nucleus of the European Competence Center for the Conservation of Cultural Heritage. The goal of the center is to organize, in digital form, the documentation or restoration and conservation activities of historic buildings, monuments and sites, and in general of the entire European cultural heritage. It consists of data such as texts, images, photos and 3D models that will enable detailed knowledge accessible to all of how such important assets are safeguarded from degradation and ruin, and how to intervene in case of disasters. Special attention is paid to laboratory analyses and to 3D models. These tools transmit the shape and the features of buildings, monuments and objects in a complete way. The coordination of the center's setup activities has been entrusted to a national research institute INFN, which manages a network of laboratories equipped for scientific analyses, to a center PIN, specialized in digital data organization, and to Inception, a university spin-off company that has developed an innovative system for using 3D models in the field of architectural and artistic heritage. At the very beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, 4CH launched an initiative called SUM, Save the Ukraine Monuments, to save the digital documentation of this nation's cultural heritage. During our work, we verified that in case of a disaster, the availability of a rich digital documentation based on images and 3D models enables more effective intervention for restoration and reconstruction. In the Ukraine case, there was, moreover, the risk that even the servers storing such data could have been damaged by the war. Thus, we organized their rescue by duplicating their data on servers in the European Union. Through a full network of direct contacts and the collaboration of other institutions, and with the approval of Ukrainian authorities, as well as the total support of the EU Commission, we organized the creation of a copy of the data on our servers, made available by INFN. The data transfer via Internet, already completed our ongoing, consists of a volume of more than 100 terabytes. Just to give an idea, the total mass of such data corresponds to 25 million high-resolution photos or to 25,000 movies, a true Netflix of the Ukrainian cultural heritage. When, hopefully soon, peace will return and the country's reconstruction will start, such copies will be given back to the Ukrainian authorities. 3D modeling technologies are of paramount importance for the restoration and the reconstruction of buildings damaged by natural disasters or, as in the Ukraine case, destroyed by the disastrous effects of war. 3D models provide precise information on the shape and the structure of buildings. They also store a complete and detailed documentation of materials, building techniques and architectural details. It is a documentation that guarantees the accuracy and the quality of restoration interventions. In addition, 3D models allow us to valorize heritage assets, facilitating visitors' understanding with virtual reality and augmented reality applications. For this reason, in the methodology proposed by 4CH, the development of 3D technologies is a key factor in the digitization process of cultural heritage. It is a process where using appropriate digital technologies, such as those available to us, is indispensable for achieving optimal results. In the Ukraine case, the main concern is safeguarding the history and the identity of a nation by preserving its cultural heritage. We hope that our technology and our skills may provide a decisive contribution to achieving this objective. Immediately after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, 4CH, the European Competence Center for the Conservation of Cultural Heritage, launched an initiative to save the digital documentation of Ukrainian cultural heritage, fearing that it might be destroyed, as indeed is sadly happening. 
descriptions, photos, and 3D models will enable the restoration or reconstruction of buildings and monuments damaged by the war. The initiative has been agreed upon with the Ukrainian authorities and strongly supported by the European Commission. Fearing that together with the monuments themselves, their digital documentation also might be damaged or lost, vast amounts of digital resources have been mobilized to store copies of such files on secure servers in the European Union, where Ukrainian colleagues can transfer documents via internet copies, which will be returned to them when peace will come back. So far, complete or ongoing saved files include more than 100 terabytes of data, a volume equivalent to 25 million high-resolution photos or 25,000 movies. Truly a Netflix of the Ukrainian cultural heritage. The rescue operation continues.
Bonjour et bienvenue. Good afternoon and welcome to Digital Assembly 2022. My name is uh, Kayla Rock and I'm going to be your guest during the two next uh, next two days here in Toulouse. We're live uh, from Toulouse and you are following us uh, Online. This event has been organized by the European Commission and the French Presidency of the European uh, uh, Union. Uh, we have developed a program, an exciting one, with top quality uh, participants. Uh, we will focus on the uh, latest uh, political and geopolitical events uh, having an impact on the digital matters. I'm going to very quickly describe the five major themes we're going to be dealing together. Starting today with the metaverse. Uh, metaverse, uh, that's a very passionate concept, innovative, and that's the reason why we're asking ourselves so many questions. What does it mean? What is the uh, stakes for Europe? What are the challenges? And what opportunities for our society? And that's uh, the way we're going to tackle this uh, uh, issue with our panel members. <coughs> And uh, then we shall talk about uh, the impact of uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, and you know that the war did uh, affect the whole uh, population. It destroyed the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure. We are going to talk about uh, how to reconstruct the infrastructure. And beyond that, how can we help uh, Ukraine uh, realize its full potential? That's for today. And tomorrow morning, we shall talk about the digital uh, value chain. Today, Europe produces, in fact, less than 10% of semiconductors and therefore very much dependent on third country, which uh, actually leads to a problem uh, in our production processes because of the shortages. Europe, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, you, the European companies, in fact, uh, detain quite a limited uh, market share. So how are we going to come up uh, with a, uh, a very frightful um, ecosystem and uh, able to uh, overcome the vulnerabilities? Then we shall also talk about the um, digital common, commons, as we call them. So uh, these means, in fact, resources which are shared in face with uh, the European values and uh, that is, in fact, an, a free, open, and uh, safe uh, digital environment uh, contributing to European sovereignty. And uh, last but not least, during our last uh, session, we shall talk about the dual um, climate and uh, um, digital change. Um, we know that the uh, uh, Information technologies, in fact, uh, generate 3% um, of the CO2. And uh, we know that technology can also help reduce such uh, um, emissions by 15 to 20% uh, in sectors like uh, transport, energy, and agriculture. So <clears throat> that's uh, the balance we're going to try to strike, that is, in fact, to maximize the positive uh, aspect of uh, digital and at the same time, reducing as much as possible its negative impact on the environment. As you can see, that's a very nice program which we need to start immediately. And to start with this conference, we have the words of welcome by the Minister of Finance and um, Industrial Sovereignty, Digital Sovereignty of France. And I give the floor to Mr. Bruno Le Maire. Le Maire. Dear representative of the European eco, uh, digital ecosystem, at a time uh, we are moving to a close of the European, of the French presidency, that's the right time to talk about the future, the digital future of our continent. That's a major ambition we've maintained and even enhanced because the digital sovereignty of Europe is highly strategic for our continent. That sovereignty has to rely on four main principles, innovation, regulation, protection, and resilience. The first principle is therefore innovation. This has to be at the core of our sovereignty. We need to support, we need to grow our champions. We need to target growth and job creation. We need to focus on our values and our rules. We need to focus on the future 
uh, so social and environmental uh, uh, <coughs> sovereignty. So we need to be uh, among the world class uh, players. That's the whole uh, reason for that uh, approach. We need to uh, emerge uh, um, 10, to, uh, 10 to 20 uh, powerful companies that can compete with the Americans and the Asians. And, and uh, we have a project which is supported by no less than 22 countries. And second is regulation, which is at the core of uh, our uh, approach. The French presidency has been characterized by major steps forward. We defined new world standards, and it's the role of Europe to define its rules, its standards that would become worldwide standards. It is important to make the platforms more accountable, in particular in terms of the content, uh, hateful, uh, falsified, and they need to be fined up to something that could be up to 6% of their uh, turnover. So the digital should not be the far west. We need to have rules in place, make sure that those rules are uh, implemented, are abided by. And the digital market would put an end to the unfair practices of some of the giants. And the large platforms today are imposing on a unilateral fashion their own conditions to the European companies like to the European users. And we reject that. The companies can be penalized up to 10% of the global turnover. And uh, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Cedric O, the uh, Secretary of State for the digital issues. So, and uh, the DSA and DMA will contribute to the function of our democracy and guarantee the rights of the users. Well, it's the state should be the one who have the last word. And uh, a great continent is a continent that is able to set its own standards. Uh, the third principle is the protection of our citizens and uh, companies against uh, attacks. Reinforcing European security is therefore a top priority in the current uh, geopolitical situation. The, uh, we have, uh, in fact, uh, reached an agreement uh, on cybersecurity, and this represents a major advancement, a major breakthrough to reinforce uh, the security of our companies and administration. We need to be able to protect ourselves against external uh, uh, attacks. Uh, this, uh, you already remember, uh, the attacks against hospitals, uh, strategic uh, uh, places, and private companies. The fourth principle is resilience of our value chain. The pandemics, the war in Ukraine, have highlighted our independence, which we cannot accept. With this dependency, makes our digital sovereignty at risk. And this issue there has been at the core of our discussions in Versailles. With our European partners, with the European Commission, we launched uh, ambitious uh, initiatives like um, regulation, uh, you know, the European Chips Act, uh, no digital without uh, subconductors, and uh, we can't do that without being able to produce semiconductors ourselves. Therefore, we need to support financially the industrial players with the purpose of uh, moving from 9 to 20 percent of the world market by 2030. And this would be a major historical change that will guarantee our independence and security with regard to the semiconductors. And this is going to be supported by a process in order to ensure uh, supply. So now they are <coughs> uh, uh, then the environmental transition and the European cloud. The first thing is that we need to reconcile digital transition and environmental transition. And in fact, digital transition would contribute to, contribute to environmental protection. It's going to, in, to influence the way we travel, will, the way we move. And this would have to be taken into account. Um, it would be uh, nonsensical to actually reduce our environmental impact while increasing our CO2 emissions via the use of the digital systems. So we need to in fact, to green, to actually green our uh, digital infrastructures, we need to review our practices 
and uh, also focus on eco-design. Now, we need to uh, have that in our agenda and to have a statement. The statement will be issued within a few days to consolidate this ambition. I would also like to focus on the cloud. The cloud is key. The hosting of data is very important. We need to support our national players, the European players, to develop a quality offer that would uh, put uh, ourselves at this level of the best in the world and not to depend on American or extra community suppliers. That's uh, the whole purpose of the um, uh, the cloud, uh, the uh, uh, which we call, in fact, the uh, PIEC cloud. We need to have a European cloud that is fully sovereign. We need to catch up, in fact. And we need to protect our most sensitive data because this is what uh, guarantees our prosperity, our independence, our sovereignty. And data is the wealth of the future. It's the economic value of the future. Data is what makes us so sovereign in, in, in the future. So the cloud, uh, cloud service certification system will help us to make way, to headway in that direction. This will help to contribute to securing our uh, the data from our citizens. In fact, the, our data should not be under the control of uh, foreign powers, whatever these powers are. We need to be able to defend our vision and our interest in the digital world. That's a difficult task, but I'm sure that the Digital uh, Assembly 2022 will help us in, to go in that direction. I would like to thank uh, Jean-Luc Moudin, the um, president of uh, 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 the city of uh, Toulouse, the mayor of the city of Toulouse, and the Occitanie. I would like to also thank the commission, the Ministry of uh, Economy, Finance, uh, and uh, they have been very much uh, involved in the preparing this major event. And I would like also to wish uh, full success of our friends from the Czech Republic who are going to be taking over the presidency from the 1st of July. And I'm convinced that digital issues would have a place of choice and this to really face uh, the challenges ahead of us. Yes, thank you so much. <clears throat> Mr. Le Maire, for these opening words. And it is now my pleasure to introduce welcoming words by the European Commissioner for the Internal Market, Monsieur Thierry Breton. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2022 Digital Assembly organized together with the French presidency, which I would like to thank very much for the strong engagement they showed in digital matters. During these two days, you will discuss very important issues, including the metaverse, the resilience of digital value chain, and the support to Ukraine in digital matters. And I would like to share a few thoughts with you, uh, I hope, which could be uh, useful for your upcoming discussions. The fast developing technologies of uh, today represent an excellent opportunity for Europe. I'm thinking of immersive technologies, external reality, and the metaverse. Concerning the metaverse, there is neither a scientific definition nor a single approach. We can look at it uh, as a virtual world where people can interact in a new ways, not only for entertainment, but also for nurturing creativity, for working together, uh, for medical uh, simulation, and a lot more. Europe is a continent of great talent and creativity. As these uh, virtual worlds are developing, our very real ingenuity, cultural diversity, and innovation can shape them and appropriate them. An ecosystem is already growing through Europe. In Italy, Latvia, France, Germany, Finland, and elsewhere, made of big players as well as innovative SMEs. At the same time, we also know that uh, big incumbent tech companies are already putting their weight into immersive technologies and the metaverse. Needless to say, there must be uh, fair competition and opportunities for all in digital, both in existing market 
and technologies as well as in emerging ones. We worked very hard in the past two years to make sure that the European regulatory framework is fit for this purpose. I'm, of course, referring here to the Digital Market Act, the DMA. Uh, with the DMA, we are stating clearly that uh, we are done waiting until uh, the damage is done and small companies are driven out of the market before intervening against gatekeeper platforms. From now on, the approach is to intervene before a violation takes place, in other words, ex ante. And uh, if a violation takes place, we are forcing dissuasive sanctions going up to even uh, a breakup order. But the metaverse is not something completely new, of course, that exists outside current policies and laws. Europe has already gone a long way to reorganize its, uh, let's say, digital space. GDPR, Digital Services Act, Data Governance Act, and Data Act, the AI Act, and so on. All these rules already apply, or will do shortly, to many key features of the metaverse, including, by the way, intermediation, advertising, social networks, and uh, algorithm issues. I hope that your discussion later today will uh, help finding ideas and proposals on how to support the growth of the nation's European ecosystems on immersive technologies. I'm looking uh, also forward to uh, hearing your views on uh, which challenges we uh, should address uh, with a priority and how uh, best we can work together, of course. My second reflection today is about value chain. The current unprecedented and tragic geopolitical situation has made resilience a priority as never before. We are in the middle of a global race to acquire raw materials. At no other time in history have we needed more lithium for batteries, rare earth for permanent uh, magnet, or silicon, of course, for semiconductors. And we depend almost exclusively on import, often, by the way, from a single country. It is a uh, high time to act. The Commission has taken the plunge here by announcing the preparation of a regulatory initiative on uh, critical raw materials. Simply put, we need uh, strong, secure and diverse supply chains. This includes new international partnerships, of course, but also the enabling condition to boost sustainable mining, uh, refining and processing capacities in Europe. And of course, more recycling and uh, a truly uh, circular use of the raw materials from the devices uh, we already have in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that uh, the twin green and digital transition will be the most powerful enabler towards more strategic autonomy and technological leadership for Europe. But to do so, we have ma to master disruptive technologies in uh, strategic areas such as uh, batteries, hydrogen, semiconductors, data, cyber security. Transform research and innovation excellence into technological and commercial leadership also will be very important. To become a factory Europe that creates jobs and uh, gives itself the means to cater for its own needs, but also to export and conquer world markets. Enormous investments are needed. Estimates uh, indicate uh, additional investment of the magnitude of over 650 billion euros per year across all ecosystems. Most of this investment will be private, of course, but we also know it will need uh, to be supplemented by public support where necessary. And this is where the uh, recovery and resilience facility has become such an essential tool. Through the investment and reforms, the RFF provides an unprecedented opportunity for cooperation among EU countries to coordinate investment efforts on common challenges, including, of course, the green and the digital transition of our industry. Today and tomorrow, your discussion will focus on uh, the digital ecosystem. The CHIPS Act is one of the answers we have given for the uh, crucial needs of uh, the semiconductor ecosystem. Europe has uh, the ambition objective of doubling our global market share from 10 percent to 20 percent by 2030, while producing the most sophisticated and energy efficient semiconductors in Europe. With the EU CHIP Act, we will improve our research, mobilize public and private funding in production capabilities, and of course, secure also all our supply chains. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we know as a recipe for uh, succeeding in digital economy, a high level of digital skills, innovative companies that have access to finance, particularly at the scale-up phase and a favorable regulatory environment. Europe has shown time and again that it can adapt and uh, thrive in uh, challenging times. I'm looking forward to hearing about uh, the results of your discussions, which will be a crucial input to uh, the work we uh, do to support Europe in its effort to equip itself with the right tools to serve its resilience and protect its people and values. Thank you very much. And thank you, Commissioner Breton. So let's start our first plenary session of the day on the future of inter internet, metaverse, and Web3. With the decennie numérique, l'Europe. With the digital decade, Europe has defined an ambitious vision for the digital era, placing basic basic citizens' rights and prosperity of the internal market of technology that digital policy needs to keep up with. These technologies are at a super early stage but we can already see an infinite number of potential applications in industry, culture, education, and entertainment. And at the same time, while all of this excitement uh, around this new emerging technology is happening, we need to ensure that these new technologies deliver benefits across society. So let me tell you a little bit about how this plenary session is gonna go. We're gonna start with a panel of academics and policymakers. They're focusing on building metaverses that respect our rights, principles, and economic situations. Then, Christelle Eidemann, the CEO of Orange, will deliver a keynote on the future of internet. And we'll finish with a second panel dedicated to investing in immersive technologies in Europe. So with that, I hope you'll join me in giving a huge round of applause to our first panelist of the day. We have with us Sebastian Soriano, the General Director of the National Institute of Geographic and Forest Information. Lina Galvez Munoz. Yes, we can applaud them. Have a seat, I'll be right there. Member of European Parliament and Vice President of the ITRA Committee. And then online with us today, we have Camille Francois, professor at Columbia University and director for Trust and Safety, as well as Has Haksu Ko, the professor, professor at Seoul National University and president of the Korean Task Force on the Metaverse. Welcome, you guys. Thank you for being here. On va commencer en français. Uh Let's start in French. I'm going to change from French to English. It's going to be really easy, but try to follow. Sébastien Soriano, uh, Thierry Breton mentioned in, in his speech, we don't have any real scientific uh, definition of metaverse. Now, could you tell us, uh, in your own, uh, anyone who knows what, vert meta what vert metaverse is actually is? Yes, good afternoon. I'm uh, very honored to try to answer this question. I would say that. Uh, we have to accept uh, that we need to be modest. Uh, I was in uh, Barcelona. I visited an exhibition uh, entitled After the End of the World. Uh, and I had a, uh, I picked up an expression which I found very strong. We are the primitives of an unknown civilization. I think that's really the challenge of our times. We have uh, uh, cave paintings. So we have a couple of, uh, of fire stones, and we're discovering a civilization. So we have to be modest. On the question of metaverse, I won't be more specific than what the commissioner said. What is uh, strong in the idea of metaverse is that we have uh, spaces of mediation, which are quite new, which are going to develop with uh, uh, capacities for sensory interactions, and they're going to explode the experiences of uh, the very limited interfaces we have today, because we mostly interact with our eyes, uh, with uh, 
uh, with a touchpad, so with a mouse. Of course, we've had uh, the first immersive experiences, but we're going to be plunged into a university, into a universe where uh, our, we will be able to activate all our senses. So it's a new mediation space where where the commissioner said we will be able to engage in a number of activities, such as uh, paying a number of things, uh, exchanging, discussing, etc. So we're plunged into the unknown. We saw how uh, the social media reinvented public space. Now <clears throat> that public space, that environment, will deploy once again in an infinite uh, dimension with new experiences. and. Uh, there will be opportunities on offer which are uh, difficult to quantify, which are going to be extraordinary, and there are a number of challenges to pick up, <clears throat> so it's difficult to define. So it's unknown and opportunities. Virtual guests, um, Professor Ko, um, so you're the president of the Korean task force on the metaverse. Um, what has the task force been focusing on, and can you also share with us here at the Digital Assembly, what's Koreans, Korea's perspective on the metaverse sort of generally? Yeah, um, as mentioned, um, it, for now, it's almost impossible to define precisely what the metaverse is. And in this initial stage, what you are trying to do uh, in South Korea is to not you know, try to come up with a, a definition, but try to systematically understand what is taking place and what is likely to uh, uh, take place in the near future, this uh, uh, sphere. And in the metaverse, when we talk about it, uh, at least within the Korean context, um, it could mean something uh, requiring a new equipment, something like a, a uh, augmented reality or virtual reality or even extended reality. Uh, but on the other hand, it could just mean using uh, existing equipment like your mobile devices and just coming up with new type of services. Uh, and uh, whatever uh, definition or whatever uh, 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 model you uh, think of, uh, there are bound to be uh, social issues that are coming up uh, policy issues that are coming up, also business-related uh, issues that are coming up. So, for instance, from a uh, consumer's angle, uh, what kind of consumer protection is issues are out there, or ethical or social norm aspect, uh, there could be harassment uh, within the metaverse, or there could be new type of privacy issues within the metaverse. So. We are trying to uh, understand what type of these, you know, new social issues are coming up out there, and also from the business angle, uh, whether there are new uh, data portability issues that we need to uh, think further, or, uh, for instance, uh, interoperability issue, uh, is what's new within the metaverse. That kind of questions are now being raised, and we are trying to. Uh, uh, systematically understand. Thank you so much. Uh, harassment was one, not one that I had anticipated, like one avatar is like harassing the other one. Um, so obviously lots of questions. My next question for you, uh, Lina Galvez Munoz, the EU has recently adopted rules to enhance the transparency of platforms. Given what our first two sort of contexts is, which is, you know, we're trying to take a position on something that we really don't know a lot about or its potential, um, do you think that these rules could be applied to future, future metaverses? And also, do you think generally that regulators are ready for the metaverse? Well, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, bonjour, merci pour, uh, pour m'inviter ici. Uh, the answer to your question is yes, the first, and okay. the second, not really, or not uh, <laughs> completely, um, I will say. On the one hand, it is true that we have the, especially the DSA, and we had advanced uh, in the regulation of the transparency of uh, platform, which is good, and the, the view of the commission is that that should be enough so far at least, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the problem we have is that we do not know yet 
the effects of all this metaverse. I mean, we don't know yet the effect of any technology because that has happened all over the uh, history. I mean, we something has been designed for, a technology has been designed in order to answer one challenge, and then it has been applied somewhere else. So uh, we don't really know. And the, but the problem now is that that is happening in an exponential way. I was speaking this morning about uh, the exponential gap that create in skills, but we could also talk about the exponential gap on regulation. I mean, uh, technological change is going faster probably than our capacity to react and regulate. Um, so we have to anticipate, uh, mm. um, do it obviously with all the democratic, um, um, or, or, or at least trying to, that uh, all the democratic rights are preserved uh, in a way, but we have also to be flexible mm. in order to evaluate what we are doing and being flexible in order that if we need to change something, we should do it. And also we have to, to have in, in mind that we are regulating for Europe, but because of the so-called Brussels effect that could also have uh, effects all over the world. And also we have to interact with other actors. And in Metaverse, obviously we know that there are other actors that are really global players. And we have also to take that, all that into, into consideration. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, lots of, of things to take into account. So I'm hearing um, flexibility and anticipation so that you can listen to the market and sort of follow what's, what's going on. Um, I'd like to um, go to Camille Francois. I think you're with us um, online. Um, so what lessons do you think we can learn from video games and social media in our approach to the metaverse? Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a great question, and, and thank you for having me. Um, if I take a step back and, and think about, you know, what are we talking about when we're talking about the metaverse? Um, I agree with all of my colleagues. It's difficult to define, and there is some risk in proposing a definition. But for the sake of, of having a dialogue and a debate together, I, I, I can venture and put something on the table. We will pick it apart. But I think... Um, we can say that in what we're trying to talk about when we talk about the metaverse, you have core definitions, core characteristics about virtual immersive environments that are persistent, that are shared and they're in 3D, and then things that are more uh, uh, modalities that may manifest or not. And so, for instance, you know, it could be with or without avatars. You know, we talked about avatars. There are many metaverses without avatars. It could be with or without um, helmets or glasses. There are many uh, metaverses that manifest through phones. Um, it could be with or without Web3. And so if we think about it in this way, I think it helps us realize that there's a very wide variety of uh, metaverses and modalities of the metaverses. And we've seen them through, uh, you know, through many different means and across different industries. I think video games indeed is an industry that had played with these idea of having 3D immersive, persistent, shared worlds that we can think about Second Life, uh, you know, a uh, few years back, we can think of um, uh, Roblox uh, these days. And I think what we can learn, what we should learn, my opinion here is we need to make sure that we don't reinvent the wheel here and that we can learn from uh, what has worked well, what hasn't worked well, the types of regulations, again, that already exist, the type of best practices that already exist in order to mitigate the socio-technical harms that may emerge in such environments. Thank you so much, Gabby. So it sounds like there's some things we can learn uh, from what's already been uh, done and the work that's already been put into place. Um, je vais switcher encore en français. Donc, uh, question pour vous. A question for you, Sébastien. We asked whether the regulators were ready for the metaverse. Other question: Are the existing infrastructures ready to adapt? to those uh, virtual reality applications, augmented reality applications? Uh, no. Nobody's ready, is that it? Well, there are telecommunications networks uh, which are of high quality in Europe. I, I was myself a telecoms regulator, a regulator in a past life. 
and uh, I would like to pay tribute to the quality of the European regulat regulatory framework. We were told for years that uh, we were regulating the players too much, but we see that we have uh, huge investments of uh, uh, high quality uh, investors. So I think it pays tribute to that regulatory framework. And I think that infrastructures of that type uh, place us in a good situation. Now, the question is, uh, about the platforms which the metaverses are going to be played on. How are we going to be able to be present on those platforms? And how can we avoid another episode where we have major players, <clears throat> where they have network effects, they have their installed databases, a big um, uh, social media, uh, web applications, etc., which are taking up positions which shut in, close in the metaverse and different uh, value chains which are linked and dependent on uh, major players and non European major players. But the topic is uh, the, the problem is uh, to greater dominance. And I think that. Uh, there is a, a sort of a mental uh, a mental change that we have to undergo in the way in which we Europeans talk about the structure and the way in which we French talk about uh, mention things. Uh, in France, often when we want to do something big, we 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 say that we're going to create an Airbus. Two, we have an Airbus of batteries, for example, of course, especially in Toulouse, where Airbus is uh, manufactured. We had an Airbus of operating systems. Uh, but the problem with Airbus is uh, as follows. Well, I have a number of big players, and by putting them together, uh, they're going to enable us to reach a critical state. But what we see with the digital is that the critical size it does not come with the the uh, addition of big players is through network effects, which means that you uh, that you bring communities together. You have uh, communities which come together and open up. So the question for us, you uh, you uh, as Europeans, uh, who are the challenges in the digital world uh, uh, faced with uh, the big players who are investing hugely in the metaverse. Well, maybe one day we'll be able to regulate them, but what we would like to do is have autonomy or independence or sovereignty in digital. But there was a workshop earlier on on the link between sovereignty and commons, so commons for free software, open hardware, open data. Uh, um, uh, um, I work on mapping and a public mapping agency, and we have alliances with a community, which is OpenStreetMap, a world community. I'm a public, of I work for a public agency, and in my country, I have 1,400 400 people working for us, but the community of OpenStreetMap in France is 40,000 contributors. So the uh, scale effects are within the communities. So what we have to do when we think about uh, metaverse uh, platforms and navigation tools, all those technological uh, building blocks which will enable the metaverse to operate, is how you go, on, you go into a commons logic. You don't want to bring together a few big uh, players to uh, uh, mime what the GAFA are doing. But we have effects of uh, s uh, scale by bringing together open communities. And how do you think uh, about public support, not public support for public, but public support for private, but public support for commons? That's what we have to invent. There's a, a tribune of 18 uh, uh, organizations of commons, which was published yesterday, which could apply to the metaverse. Thank you very much. <clears throat> That was one of the promises of Web3 in general, more transparency, more distribution of value. So to continue on that topic, Lena. 
what do you think we can do to ensure that the metaverse will be different and more fair? Loaded question. Well, yes, difficult question. Um, it was, I think it was the commissioner, uh, Thierry Breton, uh, he said that uh, one thing, the good, one good thing of the new, our new legislation is that we could add before harm, so ex ante. He mm -hmm. said exactly that uh, expression, ex ante. Um, so probably um, <laughs> we need to, to, to work also ex ante here in the sense, not regulating too much. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that there is a lot of social and economic inequalities. And unless we tackle, even out in the real world, mm -hmm. <laughs> these uh, economic and social inequalities, we will not be able to tackle these inequalities later on on the metaverse. I, think, uh, I mean, there are diff very different access to the digital world, to technology, to mm -hmm. skills, and there is a lot of risk related to that. There is risk of commodification. There is also risk of, of, of biases. We know very well gender biases, for <laughs> instance, and uh, which is very much linked to this risk of commodification, by the way, especially for, for uh, young women. So probably what we need in order to make the, the metaverse more equal is to tackle inequalities mm. in the in the real life, because inequalities are rising, especially economic inequalities. Uh, we really cannot think of uh, equal metaverse without also tackling with different economic policies and with different economic governance uh, what we are really doing in the sort of the real world. You know that, I mean, I know that metaverse yeah. will, is becoming real too, but uh, <laughs> outside of the Which world? Okay, so interesting, a really holistic approach of tackling inequalities everywhere um, uh, to make technology more equal. Um, so in talking about these sort of risks, I'd like to turn again to uh, Camille. Um, you know, we're talking about the risks and, and some of the dangers. Do you think that in the metaverse, uh, people should be worried about security issues? Um, some examples like social engineering, identity theft, or avatar theft in the ones that have avatars, um, ransomware, or maybe new threats that we haven't even imagined yet? Give it just a sec. I'm sure your volume will, will come on in just a sec. Oh, am I on now? Yes, you're on now. We can hear you. You know, I may bring a biased perspective to the question. Having worked on cybersecurity quite a bit, I feel like the answer is absolutely. All these problems will manifest, will manifest in predictable ways, ways that we have seen before. The ransomware gangs, for instance, that we have seen operating will continue to operate through these new services, but they will also manifest in new ways. I think here, the difficult thing to organize is, on the one hand, we need to make sure that we're able to take stock of the types of socio-technical harms that have emerged in different contexts. For instance, uh, that have emerged through the context of social media. And make sure that again we don't reinvent the wheel. We can quickly apply the baseline regulations that have helped hold technology uh, companies accountable, that have helped protect uh, protect citizens on these platforms. And we must also invest in the new types of research that will help us understand which of these harms will manifest differently, which are which of these harms will be new uh, and emergent, and how we can best tackle them. So. Um, yes, I believe that unfortunately we can expect more of everything that we have seen in the past with regards to the various types of social technical harms ranging from cybersecurity issues to privacy concerns to concerns with harassment, hate speech and disinformation, um, you know, in, in new and interesting ways. Got it. Okay, so the law of exponentiality uh, applies there as well. I'd like to hear some reactions um, from Professor Ko. Um, just hearing uh, what your colleagues on this panel are saying, does that resonate um, with how things are in South Korea? And then I have a question around sort of timeline um, about maybe what you guys are anticipating is this some, is, are these changes that sort of we're talking about um, and trying to prepare for something that's going to happen overnight, or is this kind of what is the time frame that we should be expecting some of this to take place? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, and from my take, uh, at least uh, based on my experience uh, from South Korea, uh, 
the whole process is more of an evolution rather than abrupt uh, change overnight. Um, and one of the reasons why all these activities are uh, 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 taking place within Korea uh, is uh, there is very active uh, computer game industry within Korea. Uh, internet in general is very active and live, uh, uh, and, and there is also very live and active entertainment industry within Korea. So um, many people are very familiar with, uh, you know, uh, 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 playing with uh, their own avatars uh, within uh, uh, cyberspace or uh, many uh, gaming companies or entertainment companies, they develop uh, what they call virtual human beings. Uh, so there are uh, in the cyberspace virtual avatars uh, who are uh, uh, celebrities in themselves. Uh, so uh, uh, sort of fake human being uh, 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 as a singer, as a, a beauty model, or you know, all different types of business models are, popping up. And at the same time, for instance, when we talk about privacy or sexual harassment, um, it, it doesn't take place in a vacuum. And for instance, if you play a computer game, there's a specific way that you can communicate with other players as a group. And sometimes you can chat uh, with uh, uh, your camaraderie, or sometimes you can have uh, physical interaction uh, with uh, another avatar. So um, with de depending on specific circumstances, uh, pleasant experiences take, can take place, unpleasant experiences can take place. Uh, so we need to go uh, into the details to understand what is taking place. And also making the whole uh, landscape uh, 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 equal or or when you consider equity or equality, um, it's just, you know, we need to consider, for instance, interoperability aspect. And there's no set conclusion, at least so far, whether uh, ensuring inter interoperability will bring in more, you know, fairer result or the others, uh, 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 the reverse would be true. So we need to, uh, kind of observe what is taking place within the marketplace. Thank you. Um, so we mentioned uh, privacy there, and, and I'd like to bring up a special population, and this is sort of an open question. This is the question for both of you, in fact. The well-being and privacy, um, especially of younger generations. We've brought up a lot of gaming, um, so maybe it's going to be oriented to them, um, sort of early adapters tend to be younger. Um, so, comment on peut protéger? so how can we set about protecting children, the underage users uh, in the metaverse? Well, there are several risk factors, as was said several times. And the risks we're looking at at IGN is not so much the issue of uh, uh, the violation of privacy, but the issue of fake universe. Uh, you might be misled or deceived uh, by uh, operating in a virtual space that gives you the impression that it is describing the reality, uh, but it's a fake reality. It's a falsified reality. And there can be intents of all nature, uh, um, you know, uh, influencing you, trying to sell you something online might be the ultimate intention. So this is the issue we have with the metaverse, the issue of uh, labeling or certification. Um, in other words, let me explain. You, are, you need to be in a space that is secure. How do we secure this virtual space? So you need to be secured uh, against a fake uh, representation of reality. We are here to depict reality. So we work on what we call digital twins. In other words, 3D model, 3D mockups that are uh, imitation of the real world. These are uh, models uh, within which you can navigate. And these are models uh, where uh, you can have uh, different uh, screenplays or scenarios. Uh, for example, you can have a simulation of the increases of the sea levels or heat waves uh, spreading across cities, etc. So we can get a simulation. So the question is, these digital twins that are a uh, certified representation of the real world around us. These digital twins, how may they be used within the metaverse as a reference? For example, we are in discussions with uh, France Television, which is uh, the uh, French uh, 
uh, broadcaster, uh, the audiovisual uh, broadcasting uh, company in France, and they are wondering about how we can, in fact, uh, thwart fake videos that would have been shot with uh, something in the background that is fake, that is falsified. So we are initiating this uh, with France Television, with the INRIA, which is the National Institute for uh, Research on Digital Issues and uh, AI-related issues, to see how we could support this kind of use. So uh, this is what we can do. This is the security uh, aspect on which we're working on at IGN. Protecting minors. Um, I'm, I'm glad this um, subject is uh, on discussion and to learn about what is uh, done and uh, because uh, it's something it worries me a lot as a regulator and but also some other of a 11 years old daughter and uh, because I'm really very worried because kids are vulnerable, you were explaining very well, yeah. are more vulnerable than adult. Uh, uh, people. We have already um, done certain things. For instance, in the TSA, we ban uh, target advertising for children because it was the same principle that they are more vulnerable. And the, um, uh, the European Commission just uh, published the new European strategy for a better internet for kids just uh, last, uh, last month where um, uh, children should be protected, empowered, and respected uh, on, online. Also, at the DSA, the, the principle is what is illegal offline is illegal online as well. So this principle, I think, should be applied here too. Um, but we have to be very worried of all the cyberbullying and also the, the cyber violence. Um, because also, again, regarding also, for instance, gender, uh, because that could uh, even increase gender stereotyping, and that could also discipline uh, um, most vulnerable people. I mean, if you, at the end, uh, uh, if someone receives a cyberbullying or cyber attack or whatever, it's not only that individual person that received the attack, but it's the whole group mm. that is receiving, in a way, the attack also, and. Um, cutting their freedom and their privacy and everything because at the end it's kind of alert yeah. and it's kind of a, dis a way to discipline the population. So we have to be very, uh, very, very careful and in this respect regarding children we should be very courageous and uh, be always with eyes uh, very open to, to protect the most vulnerable because these children will be the citizens of the, of the future. For sure. Thank you so much. Um, before we wrap up, uh, I'd like to leave maybe some closing words to uh, Camille and Professor Ko, who are online. Um, you know, we're talking about alternative realities, and is that a big deal? Uh, if my reality is not the same as yours, is that dangerous? Is that something we should protect against? Um, and if you guys just want to share some final remarks with us um, as we close this panel, that would be great. Maybe Camille, you can kick us off. Yeah, um, you know, I think something that, that stays with me is uh, we overall, I believe, are in a better place when thinking about how to do responsible innovation in tech today than many years ago. And thinking about, you know, those big trends and thinking uh, around responsible innovation, I think we've learned and we've learned a hard way perhaps sometimes that those interventions needed to happen more in the design phase, and that it's important to think about how do you design responsible technologies, um, you know, as we also, of course, think about how do you mitigate the bad, imp bad impacts down the road. But I'm encouraged by having this conversation around how do you design for safety? How do you design for a safety in the metaverse? How do you design to protect kids online? Um, and, I'm, and I'm hoping that as uh, all those different versions of the metaverse unfold before us, uh, we can help guide this thinking of addressing these socio-technical harms in the design phase and perhaps earlier than we have in previous waves of innovation much. Um, and so for our last words, uh, Professor Ko, um, would you like to help us? You opened our panel, or no, you didn't open our panel, but uh, would you close our panel for us, please? Yeah, um, and um, I just wanted to add one aspect that uh, we uh, didn't have an opportunity to talk about, uh, which is we basically talked about what 
is taking place or what will take place within the metaverse and, and uh, the possible problems that we need to pay attention to. Uh, but at the same time, what need to, we need to uh, consider is what's taking place outside the metaverse, uh, by which I mean the people who cannot or will not join the metaverse. Um, for one, uh, in the education sphere, uh, we already talk a lot about uh, using uh, AL or VL equipment for educational purposes, but what if uh, there are a significant group of uh, students out there who just don't have the, the, you know, who just cannot afford to buy equipment or uh, their, their government uh, cannot afford to give them equipment? That's one aspect. And another aspect is, um, you know, uh, I have a teenage daughter and I have a, a real equipment in my home. And my teenage daughter, you know, didn't take a minute for her to uh, make herself familiar with this real equipment. But my mom, who is very old, you know, she could never imagine uh, using a real equipment. So for senior citizens, um, if there's uh, uh, comes a day when uh, uh, the metaverse becomes uh, prevalent in our daily lives. Uh, how to educate them and and you know let them use uh, this equipment and and uh, use uh, for their daily lives for you know and you know useful manner. That's a big uh, task that our society will face. Thank you so much. That's a really good point, and we're going to end on that. Um, really, just making sure that we're taking into account all the populations on the margin and bringing them into the fold on this emerging technology that we all have a ton to learn about. Um, so with that, um, let's give you guys a big round of applause. And also for you guys online, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. So now I'd like to welcome to the stage the CEO of Orange, Christelle Eidemann, who will give her keynote on the future of the internet. Bonjour, Madame Eidemann. Hello, Mrs. Eidemann. Hello, hello. Good afternoon to everyone, and thank you very much, and congratulations uh, for having organized uh, today's uh, meeting. I've just listened uh, to the panel on the metaverse. So indeed, we talk a lot about the metaverse. Uh, and I will be talking about the internet of the future. The metaverse is something that we've been talking a lot about, and yet it's a term that was coined back in the 1990s. In the Virtual Samurai, a science fiction book, there have been several attempts to turn this into a reality. Uh, the game Second Life in 2003 that uh, was, of course, halted and stopped during the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, we were talking about the metaverse and there were discussions uh, to find out, in fact, uh, what reality exists behind this parallel virtual world. This is a world where every user can actually use or give a digital life in 3D or 4D, can have an avatar, in other words. Uh, this definition uh, is not based on a consensus. It's not... Uh, uh, agreed on by everyone, but we may wonder whether the metaverse is one of the shapes that the Internet of the future will take on, based on uh, uh, thriving uh, technologies, virtual reality, uh, blockchain, uh, metaverse, uh, avatars, etc. The social media have developed thanks to the 4G technology and uh, high-speed uh, Internet uh, on the social media uh, now. This should allow for new um, business, cultural, and social practices. We know that the larger companies are already working on the metaverse. There are some video games that are highly popular that are already offering uh, virtual environments of this nature. And major tech uh, companies that we all know have already announced that they are going to invest, and they've already invested millions of dollars in this area. But the metaverse, as we imagine it, does not yet exist 100%. Everything has to be invented. There are many substantive issues that need to be solved, some of which were raised in the previous panel. We will have to collectively answer this question before we dive into the unknown. We need to comply with the environment, comply and respect future users, and make sure that all of the uh, players involved are respected. So it is the internet of the future that we're wondering about. What are the opportunities? What are the risks? And what are the challenges? The uh, uh, technological as well as uh, so uh, social and societal uh, challenges, as already mentioned today. For us, 
at Orange, the number one challenge uh, of the Internet of the Future has to do with the strong growth of traffic generated by the users that keep changing. The load on the network should grow exponentially in the next uh, few years. According to a study carried out by Credit Suisse, the networks will face up to 24 times more traffic within one decade, which is, of course, a considerable amount. Fixed networks as well as mobile networks are the backbone of the digital uh, ecosystem and have shown their worth uh, during the uh, different lockdown and other crises that we've experienced for the last two years. Being able to rely on uh, high, very high-speed networks uh, uh, became a major concern, a priority in Europe. Our telco operators are uh, the forerunners of this incredible project, and we consider that the investments, annual investments in the entire industry are almost 10 times higher than that of uh, the road infrastructures for motorways. Now, this uh, unavoidable uh, growth in traffic on our networks make it possible and make it compulsory to implement uh, the European Declaration on the digital rights and obligations and principles. We need uh, to set up adequate frameworks so that all of uh, uh, the uh, players on the market capitalizing on this digital transformation assume their responsibilities and participate in a fair and equitable and proportionate uh, to the costs of goods, services, and public infrastructures for the benefit of all European citizens. If we wish to be able to support uh, the deep uh, changes uh, in the uses of internet in the future, for example, the metaverse, operators have to be supported. Uh, and there has to be a better breakdown of the financial costs uh, uh, involved uh, with the investments in the networks. Just an example of that. I think I should remind you that almost 55% of all traffic today on our networks in Europe is generated by just a handful of uh, players. That being said, and these are the French figures, the operators supported almost 80% of all investments in the digital arena in 2020 and account for 70% of jobs for less than 50% of uh, income. This unbalance, economic unbalance, that will get worse uh, that could get worse and jeopardize all of the business model of the digital uh, sector uh, should not hide another unbalance, which is that of the uh, use of our natural resources. Unless there is a, another uh, universe, another virtual planet, uh, we would have, in fact, uh, to preserve what we have, the universe we have. We can legitimately raise the issue, the following issue, with what resources, which energy are we going to be using to develop uh, such a virtual planet? And it's our strategy in, within Orange. We have set ourselves ambitious uh, targets uh, to be neutral uh, from uh, carbon, I mean, CO2 uh, point, uh, uh, emission point of view. We need to resort to a circular economy. We need to resort to uh, renewable energies. And we know that the road is quite long, still long, but uh, our efforts are bearing fruits. We have reduced our CO2 emissions by 12% uh, since 2015. And this uh, uh, at a time when the traffic has been increasing. We are collecting uh, uh, one third of the mobiles, I mean old mobiles, and uh, also our life boxes. We need also to take into account uh, the uh, digital uh, uh, gap, and the metaverse has to be taken that into account. We need to make sure that the emergence of, uh, uh, of a society that would, in fact, uh, leave aside those who cannot access the digital uh, mm, services will not be society that can work. We need to make sure that everybody can access the digital services. We, we think about uh, the future of the internet and the uh, social services that it can develop. Well, the digital would be good only if it helped to reduce inequalities. And w uh, I think that all uh, digital players, whether they be government, regulator, industrialist, and the civil society, uh, have a role to play. And we have to draw the lessons of the past uh, to create the conditions for developing an, infer an internet of the future that meets our needs. And that's the reason why we need to uh, attach a great importance in the to the conditions like uh, the regulations, standardization, security. We need also to <coughs> listen to the uh, concerns that are expressed. 
uh, uh, how to know that the uh, mid, uh, avatar is the one uh, I'm expecting, how to secure my payments. We need to come up with convincing answers to these questions. Last but not least, I would like to sound a little bit more optimistic because I'm convinced that the Internet of the future will be offering plenty of opportunities which we need to grasp. Opportunities, uh, well, we do have an idea what those are opportunities are likely to be. You just have to watch what the Z and Alpha generations are doing to see the innovations. And they w will, in fact, represent 30% of the consumers. And uh, uh, also, our workers, our uh, people in our companies are within that generation. So new uh, social uh, practices will emerge, in particular in terms of entertainment, uh, like uh, live concerts uh, and in virtual environment, immersive videos, watching uh, uh, soccer games, uh, 360 degree immersion and uh, specific, uh, uh, really stunning exper experience and thanks to the hybrid world. The Internet of the future should first and foremost enable companies to uh, gain in terms of efficiency, to enable our customers to do their shopping with the uh, virtual uh, headset. Uh, in certain cases, they have to be able to work without having to go to their offices. We need to also to provide assistance remotely. In particular, I'm thinking to, uh, uh, re remote uh, uh, telemedicine, uh, preventive uh, 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 assistance. All those are critical f uh, innovations for our companies. And Orange is, it will be a player in the Internet of the future. This is uh, obvious. And we shall be at the forefront of innovation because this is part of our DNA. And within Orange, we think that our responsibility is also to, on a day-to-day -day basis, to respond to our customers' needs in terms of enhanced or increased connectivity. And this means that we need to protect their personal data, uh, in fact, uh, uh, protect their privacy, and also act uh, uh, in a responsible way vis-a-vis -vis our uh, customers and suppliers. And we know that we can't do that uh, alone. Nothing can be done alone. The values that uh, accompany the emergence of the 4G <coughs> has led to the emergence of the uh, uh, big uh, um, internet players. And we need to think about the 5G and what uh, the consequences are likely to be. In any case, we need to support our, our companies, our, I mean, uh, our uh, customers, when in particular the startups. We do have funds uh, set aside for supporting the startups. And we are convinced that we are at the eve of um, a new change, why not a revolution? And this, of course, involves uh, potentially risks from an environmental point of view. And uh, we know that the uh, regulatory framework is not yet fully balanced. We need to really uh, act at a European level to take full advantage of the Internet of the future, and all of that has to be done in uh, connection with our European values. Well, thank you. Thank you for your contribution. our second panel on this session, um, and it is on investing in immersive technologies in Europe. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Alex Juba, the CEO of Lucid Reality Labs, which is a Ukrainian company that offers VR and AR business solutions, as well as Alexandre, by we, we can clap, it's great, Alexandre Zapolsky, the CEO of Linagora, a French developer of open source software, Emilia Stormenova Du, the Slovenian Secretary of State for Digital. And online we have joining us uh, live Laura Olin, the COO of Zoen. Zoen is a Finnish company that provides solutions for organizing virtual events. Welcome everybody. Thank you for being here with us. Um, so let's start with you, Alex. Um, on the previous panel, we uh, attempted to define the metaverse. Uh, do you have a definition and um, and maybe like a timeline? Technology, you know, 
looking from the technology standpoint, how close are we to realizing the metaverse? Thank you very much. First of all, um, uh, I must say that that is very, very important discussion we have now. And uh, there are some uh, really interesting definition of what is metaverse. If you ask me, I would put it very simple. It is the next generation of interaction between people. And uh, this concept blends um, physical and digital existence and uh, helps to move to, from flat 2D, uh, two-dimensional environment to 3D-dimensional environment. Um, yeah, and uh, previous uh, panel uh, representative, I understand them, they represent uh, policy makers, regulators, but I think I'm from the other side of, of, of this uh, concept and this development technology, I represent uh, companies that develop metaverse. So we, we look at it a bit differently. So uh, based on our understanding and our perception of metaverse, metaverse should be common there is only one metaverse. There are no, no, not many metaverses. Metaverse consists of different worlds, digital worlds. So it's common. It's open for everyone. It's ungoverned. It is decentralized. It is scalable. It's autonomous. It has no borders. So there are no French metaverse or in, uh, UK or <laughs> US. This is a new concept and we have to be ready for this. And one of the challenges is uh, to get an understanding and education of, of people, companies, what is real metaverse and how we can exist in this real. How close we are? Uh, to answer this question, I would um, start with uh, um, structuring. What, what components metaverse has? So the first component is hardware. And we are developing, uh, the hardware component is developing very fast. If you take on the, if you take a look at the major uh, hardware companies, it can be Apple, Meta, Microsoft, they are investing around from 20 to $25 billion every year for uh, investing in R&D. So they, they, they put a lot of efforts and we are moving very fast. The second component is software. And this is a very, uh, it's a great opportunity for small players, for big players, because one, one of the uh, pillars of uh, metaverse is co-creation. So individual can create some elements or some, some worlds, uh, companies, enterprises, gov governments. And uh, yeah, we, if we are talking about software, we can uh, think about uh, digital twins, avatars. We can think about uh, uh, blockchain technology, which should be a part of metaverse. Um, and, and many, many other components. And, and the third one is uh, infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure is a uh, cloud computing, it's a high-speed internet, and, um, and we, we, we see how it's uh, extend the rollout of 5G is uh, um, increasing right now, and the next level of, ne next generation of high-speed internet, 6G internet, so it will allow to transfer, to transmit terabytes of data in, and uh, it, it will give an opportunity to connect with people in the metaverse, millions of people to run metaverse and uh, here we have still a lot of opportunities. So I would say there are some limitations. We are at the early stage of development, probably for the next five to ten years we will get something uh, accessible for, for people for the mass market. Well, thank you so much, Alex. That was a great overview of everything that we need to have in mind uh, about the metaverse. And you're right to point out, you know, we had a very um, private sector panel to start, and now it's interesting to hear more from the, the private sector about, you know, what the differences are um, when you're thinking about the metaverse. So, je vais switcher en français, donc, pour Alexandre. To Alexander. During the first panel, we talked about uh, the responsibility of uh, the public institutions with regard to the metaphors and the role that the, uh, they can play, so they should uh, protect but not prevent. And uh, from a private point, of, private point of view, what are the responsibilities, the ethical responsibility uh, for the startup, for the corporate uh, companies, what are their responsibilities? 
Well, first of all, I'm expected to, to answer in French or it as you like it, uh, normally in your own language, uh, but I know that you also speak English very well, so it's up to you. I assume that you speak English better than I speak French, says the moderator. So, but since we're in Toulouse and in France, and to ensure some sort of parity between French and English, I'm going to continue speaking French. So, first of all, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today with you and be part of this panel. We're already talking about the future of Internet the, or the Internet of the, Internet of the Future. A number of studies, like uh, one by McKinsey that uh, was uh, published a few days ago, said that uh, by 2030, the, uh, and in fact, uh, people would be spending six hours per day on the metaverse. It's uh, something, it's not something that can be neglected. When we say that uh, the uh, uh, metaverse is the future of the internet, it's really something massive. 5,000 billion will be de uh, invested to develop the metaverse between now and 2030. Already 120 billion have been invested in 2022, have been invested in technologies linked to the metaverse, not just uh, the 3D, but the overall web free area. And that's a, a huge phenomenon. The second thing I would like to remind you of is that uh, these technologies are mainly based on open source technologies. And it's important to bear that in mind, to understand that, because Europe has already, uh, uh, always played a, uh, a, I mean, a, a pioneer role in open source. Henri Verdier, our ambassador, uh, said that, in fact, we shouldn't consider, uh, uh, in fact, developing uh, a different approach, not say that we are going to, as Europe, develop the third uh, approach or way to, uh, to the internet, the third digital way. It, we need to consider ourselves as developing the first, not the third, something between the Asian and the American ones, but the first. So even though the amounts uh, invested are already huge, and those to come are also very significant. We have to convince ourselves that we're not lagging too much behind. We always have the impression that we're lagging behind in many areas, in particular with regard to the cloud or the uh, microchips or the semiconductors, uh, uh, as Commissioner Breto underscored. It's not because we start late, uh, you know, the race between the turtle and uh, the hare. You can, in fact, uh, start late, but to uh, arrive first. So there is no, thing, no, no useless battle. We can always catch up. In with regard to the web free, web free, we are not particularly lagging behind. I, it is quite uh, uh, surprising that uh, the European Commission can take this subject. Uh, it, we should be happy. To, the, to see that the Commission is um, actually uh, taking that uh, subject at hand. And uh, to answer you, the other part of your question, well, I would say that uh, I am in favor of what I would say ethical, free, open, uh, inter uh, I mean, uh, uh, internet, uh, in particular, in the er era of uh, metaverse. Metaverse should not be only commercial. And uh, the one uh, proposed by the big tech, well, and uh, well, uh, I, I need to mention uh, companies' names. I'm sorry, I don't know what the protoc protocol is. Uh, but uh, we wouldn't like a metaverse provided only by Meta and Facebook. So, dear Alexander, we want a, an open metaphor, interoperable, interoperable, and from now on, we need to get organized for that purpose. We have come up with regulatory tools, as was reminded uh, in uh, the previous roundtable, the ex ante regulation. So we need to think about the future and create the conditions that would uh, make competition open, fair competition, and it's up to the 
legislator, to the regulator, to really consider that as of now, so that we as companies, um, European, French, uh, global companies, to really be able to compete fairly. Now, I think events like this are aimed at um, promoting the role models. All body um, uh, knows uh, the meta, oh, but there are a number of ch champions like uh, the one represented to my left hand side. Now, but in front, we do have leader companies, uh, so Rare, with regard to the NFTs. Ledger is also yet another company, a legacy uh, player of block blockchain, web free, and uh, and uh, uh, wallet components, and uh, new players are emerging who are to the B2B blockchain, Archipel.io, which is uh, in developing smart contract tools for companies, so that, in fact, uh, uh, they would be able to uh, use more smartly, uh, 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 smartly the blockchains. And there are also uh, many other companies and I'm not sure that everybody knows that. Well, and I would like to end with an initiative which I think is very important. The web free technologies can also be mobilized to have uh, a positive impact, a for good impact. Uh, Cactus Sift is one of the companies who launched what they call the DAO, in fact, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, DOO and to organize distribution of tokens or initial to uh, coin offers. And thanks to the uh, uh, this system, they were able to raise uh, 10 million euros in order to, to, to debug the world. They were going to address specific subjects, so to raise money, thanks to the blockchain, create investment community in order to change the world. This is also what these new ethical companies are all about, and this can be done thanks to the web free and the metaverse. Evening. I know that we didn't have your headset on, but um, you know, both um, uh, Alex and Alexandre talked about sort of the promises um, of Web3 that are that are really noble, right? Um, transparency, trust, safety, co-creation. Um, how do you think uh, we can achieve this? Thanks a lot. So even though I'm not a huge fan of the virtual world, uh, I assume it would have been much easier if I was in the virtual world and I wouldn't need the headset. Yes, probably. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, yes, immersive technologies uh, bring the possibility to more human-friendly, personalized access to the virtual world. We heard a lot about that uh, at this roundtable and even uh, in the previous ones. So they're enabling the interaction, uh, the experience of assessing the virtual and real environment, uh, and of course in a more integrated uh, and intuitive way. Uh, there are many, many advantages, so uh, there are some activities that can be implemented which were not able before or maybe we can improve these activities. But as you mentioned, we must, we must not forget uh, and we must be really aware uh, that uh, there is a part of the general public uh, that is extremely mistrustful of new technologies. Uh, so uh, why is this so? It's because it deprives a person of his or her autonomy and control uh, over his own environment or some other activities. Uh, so uh, a lot of times these activities Activities are implemented uh, with technologies that one does not fully understand, uh, does not uh, have control uh, or trust of them. So uh, on one hand, uh, we are speaking about the robustness, the reliability, the safety, uh, and use of devices. And then on uh, the other hand, uh, there are increasingly pressing questions about the ethics and the safeguarding of human rights and fund uh, fundamental freedoms concerning the use of advanced products and services. So how to deal with this? Uh, the Commissioner Breton already uh, mentioned some of the uh, acts uh, at the European Commission. So at the European level, uh, these issues uh, that I previously mentioned have been central issues when preparing uh, a human-centric framework uh, for the development and the deployment of trustworthy AI, which is we all know as the AI regulation. 
Uh, and this regulation uh, will be based on the universal values uh, of the European Union uh, and uh, the um, uh, human rights and uh, uh, fundamental freedoms with the focus of privacy, dignity, consumer rights, and of course, non-discrimination. So what is really important here is that um, the member states adopt this act uh, as soon as possible. Uh, so uh, the uh, introduction of the uh, immersive technologies in the existing digital ecosystem uh, will bring even more integration uh, at the level of systems as well as infrastructure. Uh, and as well, uh, it will also increase the human interaction with the virtual world, uh, which will uh, only increase the issue of regulation and governance. So uh, this is addressed in a clearer and a more broader way uh, in the European proposal of the digital rights and uh, principles. Uh, so uh, the member states will need to face this issue, uh, and this will be helped by the experience of dealing with uh, the artificial intelligence. So for example, in Slovenia, we have the National Programme for Artificial Intelligence, and uh, we specifically highlighted uh, the um, issue of public trust, uh, where we want to ensure the understanding of the effects and impacts in this area uh, in the future, mainly by uh, setting a clear focus on ethical AI, uh, ensuring security and human rights. Uh, then involvement of all different kinds of uh, stakeholders coming really from different sectors. Uh, then uh, we would like to involve uh, interdisciplinarity of experts. And here, when we say experts, it's not only about technological experts, but also uh, experts in the field uh, of ethics, law, uh, and social sciences. Uh, then transparency uh, of planning and implementation of activities, if we would like to gain this trust by the public then I know that you would not like to hear this, but also adequate legal regulation uh, and supervision uh, that uh, increases pre uh, predictability, but on the same time does not limit innovation, which, however, should be trustworthy, uh, then human-centric, and of course, it should respect the human rights. Uh, and then uh, it is important uh, to plan educational training and awareness training activities for all uh, stakeholders. So all this will allow to face uh, the challenges as individuals, but also as a society in an appropriate way uh, by seizing opportunities on one side and at the same time avoiding dangers. So uh, in this sense, uh, Slovenia as a country sees the need for international collaboration uh, and above all international standardization. Thank you so much. Um, I'll give you a chance to respond to the govern, go, the ungoverned or self-govern uh, um, comments, because uh, it's interesting to debate some of that. But first, I'd like to bring in uh, Laura, who's online with us. Um, we've been talking a lot about sort of uh, metaverse broadly, um, but this panel is also about just immersive technologies, um, not just the metaverse. And, and you have a really specific use case, which is around events. Um, so could you share with us um, you know, how are you imagining the future of events using virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality, all the realities? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here, and I would love to be there with you, but I'm today I'm here in Helsinki. Yeah, actually, I think that the, um, things go forward so fast that uh, virtual events, it's only a little part of what we are doing. Um, Yes, in fact, in the beginning of the pandemic, we organized together with the city of Helsinki this virtual concert that reached 1.4 million Finns. There are 5.5 million Finns in total, which was organized in virtual Helsinki that today you would call a metaverse. Back then, nobody really talked about metaverse like two years ago. But since then, um, we have been focusing on creating our own metaverse that is called cornerstone.land. And all of these issues that you are addressing and have been addressing are very important, but I think that uh, we really need to start working on those because um, what, uh, what we have been doing, it is a virtual, uh, virtual world, virtual island, 
that is a, a very much Web3 build on blockchain. We have currently been doing private sales of lands. You can buy a piece of land as an NFT, uh, pay it with Ethereum, and uh, then you become a member of the community. And of course, the idea is that we want to give power to the creators on the cornerstone. And why this has been such an exciting project is that it's fully photorealistic. So, uh, yeah, whenever you have time, go and check out cornerstone.land website and you will understand it. But basically, uh, we have been also the test case, the pilot case, at least here in Finland, in, in, in many ways. We've been talking with the tax authorities, trying to understand what kind of VAT we need to take into consideration when we sell these lands. The answer is that that VAT should be included in the price. Uh, we've also been um, discussing with banks that if we deal with cryptocurrencies, uh, uh, how, how will it affect our relationship with the bank? Well, the answer there is that one bank sees it as a really big, big red flag. The other bank thinks it's fine. Uh, and then also, um, uh, basically, uh, we still don't know when we want to start trading on the platform, how will we be able to do that? Uh, will the finance inspection be able to tell us how to deal with that? So uh, that is still a bit unclear. But my point here is that, uh, yes, I think this is definitely one of the most ambitious projects going on within the metaverse uh, here in the EU. And we, for sure, don't want to let uh, Mark Zuckerberg or anyone from the US rule the metaverse. We have such a great talent here. We have a lot of ideas. We want to bring the Nordic values to metaverse, thinking about ethics, the sustainability. How do we produce all the energy that is needed in order to run all these platforms? So there are so many issues to solve that it's amazing that we are talking about this right, right now. And um, yeah, yeah. I don't even know if I answered to your <laughs> question, but at least I have some like, I, I think that at least we have a lot of practical examples already and we also will need answers quite soon. Otherwise we won't be able to run this business. For sure. Um, and so you're right, and it's something that Alexandre mentioned that we're, we're definitely on time, maybe a little ahead of time, you know, um, working on this. Laura, I'd like to stay with you um, because you're really pioneering some of these and experimenting um, with different um, partners and actors who are also trying to maybe figure out how to interact um, with what you're doing. Um, you know, maybe you could share with us, what do you think a healthy relationship um, would look like between some of the bigger platforms and the smaller actors? And, you know, is there anything that you've learned um, in working with these banks or, or other um, actors that we could, you know, you sort of paved the way for us. What do we need to know from your experience? We as a virtual studio also work with a lot of companies from different parts of the world. and. Our main tool when we create Cornerstone is Unreal Engine, that is uh, by Epic Games, that is uh, owned by, partly by Tencent from China and so on. So I, I don't think that you can start doing any of these metaverse things without like interacting with a lot of other uh, companies. And of course, like in the end, we also see the world, or in the end, whenever that will be, but in the future, we see that, of course, the metaverse will be like a, a network that is full of different kind of operators and, and content. And, 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 and we think that it's, it's really good if there is this chance to be interoperable and also to switch from platform to another. I know that uh, I have, in fact, an 11-year-old kid in front of me uh, in Minecraft right now, and, and then on the other hand, what we are building with Cornerstone, have, that has been very appealing more for like more adult audiences. So like internet nowadays, there will be a lot of different audiences and a lot of different purposes why you want to use this. So um, what we basically need is just like, um, of course, investment, and it's, it's great to hear that that is coming. 
uh, it, it seems that in the US, in China, there's a lot of private investment, but it would be very natural, I think, within EU to have like some sort of like a public funding um, for this. And uh, yeah, and, and, and um, <laughs> overall, like clarity for regulation so that I, I don't know about other countries, but at least in Finland, we have the tendency of to forbid everything that we don't know for sure is, is legal. So, so just to avoid that situation, it would be really great to have like a more clarity and, and, and of course regulation is definitely needed, but, but what is allowed and what is not, why doesn't one bank let us be their client and the other bank would let us be their client because we are dealing with cryptos. I, I don't understand. Thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to bring it back um, uh, in this reality. I don't know how to, I'm, I'm mixing up my vocabulary now. Um, and just to get to a question about uh, recruiting. Um, is it easy or hard to recruit talent um, in this area? What's your experience, Alex? Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy, yeah. okay. Uh, it's a new dynamic and um, the technology is developing so fast. Almost uh, every two, three weeks we have new updates and it's difficult to catch up with this technology. And uh, uh, there are quite a, a big pool of talents from gaming industry, okay. which, which we recruit for non-gaming, virtual augmented and mixed reality experiences, simulation for healthcare, for pharma, for education for uh, defense, aerospace. So, uh, yeah, we need more talents. That is a yes, conclusion. Yeah, uh, I know that tends to be sort of the conclusion across all of tech um, today. So I was curious about how um, it applies to this specific sector. So, Alexandre, est-ce que vous avez aussi... Um... Alexandre, do you have... Uh, any leads to recruit from the gaming sector, or maybe you don't have any difficulties to recruit? Well, I think that uh, the talent war applies to everybody. Our particular uh, chance is that uh, in the metaverse uh, and Web3 technologies, uh, there is a competition with uh, uh, players which are by uh, uh, design heavily financed, they have a lot of uh, money, there's high competition, it's even more difficult if we compare just on the basis of uh, salaries. Uh, your, best, uh, uh, your best people will be attracted by two or three <clears throat> times more than you can pay them. Not because you don't pay them very much, but there's such a competition that uh, they're going to be attracted uh, elsewhere. However, it is possible to resist if you have a real meaningful project at Dinagora. Uh, we define ourselves as good, as good tech for good. Uh, you don't join any old company when you join uh, Vinagora. So the notion of uh, commitment, of impact, of general interest, uh, that uh, comes to play with uh, young engineers, and we work on that. I don't know whether you're asking what you're asking that because uh, <clears throat> we are going to have a new headquarters for Linagora in the Paris region. So we'll be in the metaverse, of course, but we'll have uh, uh, bricks and mortar headquarters. But we are buying a big villa, and there's a room which will be reserved for immersive experiences and living in the metaverse in HQ. So we don't need a physical, uh, uh, physical offices uh, as we used to have in a business district in La Défense in Paris like we needed before. The immersive technologies will also have a main impact on B2B and the way in which companies are organized. What is uh, obvious is that COVID taught us all to develop hybrid uh, working systems. And when we have a digital assembly here, there, is number, there are a number of people who uh, are listening to us and watching us at a distance, and uh, it works. It may even more so with the metaverse, and companies will be uh, physical and digital. The metaverse will, of course, help in that. 
these are huge investments which will have to be made. And if you add the investments in building blocks, uh, in uh, basic software and infrastructure, which was described by Alex, uh, competition on wages, the new investment we have to carry out. Our Finnish friend uh, uh, stated that we needed public funding. Yes, I think there is a need for, for massive investment. We uh, we don't need metaverse acts in five years or 10 years' time. That will be too late. We need them now. We need to become organized now to uh, set up a massive public support plan because the digital we want is different from the American uh, digital, which is proprietary, enterprise driven, commercial, to carry out uh, uh, open source uh, digital, digital commons. You can't ask our companies to follow the same economic model. So if if, they, if we don't have any public, uh, public spending, uh, we won't manage it. If we have France 2030, perhaps we could have a Sovereign Tech Act. There's a commissioner Breton was saying we're waiting for your inputs and the results of our of your work. So that is my pen is worth. And there's also the sandbox, which is another metaverse play, which I didn't mention earlier on. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, and we need it quickly. Um, um, our session is coming to a close, so do you think you could share with us um, what sectors do you think can benefit the most from this? I agree, we need public funding, and this is the message we should send to Commissioner Breton. He said that he's really looking forward to hear the results, so maybe this should be in the conclusion. <laughs> Uh, yes, so which sectors? Of course, uh, the ones that uh, will help people to interact more easily and intuitively with the environment and also to optimize the activities. Uh, so to, uh, due to the increased integration of the physical and virtual environment. Uh, so uh, what we will need is adequate digital infrastructure, uh, then general connectivity, of course, uh, data uh, and uh, services interoperability uh, and interconnection. Uh, there are many different sectors that can gain a lot of benefits. So just to name a few, uh, the health, education and training, uh, then uh, industry, pharmacy, uh, culture and cultural heritage, of course, tourism as well. Uh, so to be sincere, I cannot think uh, of a sector that will not gain uh, any benefit uh, of uh, these technologies, but of course it should be adapted appropriately. And because we're finishing with this se uh, session, when we're speaking, about investments, we must not uh, forget about uh, the digital divide because we know that this technology is expensive technology. We heard uh, Alex mention the experts, so uh, it's very hard to get people and this may lead to huge imbalance. So uh, this is one thing uh, that we must not forget about. And uh, we must uh, make sure, uh, we must not forget that the chain is as strong as its weakest link if we are speaking about Europe now, because we want to have a European uh, force in metaverse. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, we also said that the metaverse uh, should have, uh, must has no borders. So I completely agree with that. Uh, it means that everybody uh, should have the chance to be part of that. Thank you so much. And maybe if we can make it more inclusive, we'll have more tech uh, talent uh, and we can solve everybody's, everybody's problem. Um, let's close with uh, Laura. Um, do you have any reactions? Do you agree we need massive funding, uh, public funding? Um, what is your final message for us here in Toulouse at the Digital Assembly? Yeah, definitely I agree with all of that funding. My Maybe final final message would be that it's so easy to start talking about the regulations and threats and problems that arise, but maybe it would be nice also to focus on the opportunities that this new metaverse thing brings to all of us eventually. I can give you one concrete example that we just made um, with uh, an ad, ad, ad agency, TBWA, for this charity company uh, that help people uh, uh, to fight home homelessness. 
So we were selling virtual apartments in a metaverse. And when you buy a virtual apartment, you all donate a real home to a real life family. And already like eight families have got home through this metaverse initiative. And, and that is not like digital, that is real, real life, real roofs over their heads. So I think that there are also so many great opportunities that Metaverse brings about. So let's not forget those. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists. Let's give you guys a big round of applause. We really appreciate you being here with us for the digital assembly. Thank you. It is now time for a quick coffee break. Um, so just so you know, we're gonna meet back here in the plenary um, session and our next session is on digital support for Ukraine. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Stretch, get some coffee and network and we'll see you back here in just a few.
Okay, Tatiana, so that's fine to us. So we start in um, in 10 minutes, so just be ready and uh, have a good session. Thank you very much. So just that Tatiana, n'oubliez pas, vous avez 15 minutes de discours de Monsieur Federoff, et ensuite notre animatrice va poser les trois questions qu'on vous a envoyées par email, et chaque fois il faudra retraduire ce que Monsieur Federoff répond, s'il vous plaît. Et bien traduire les questions auprès de Monsieur Federoff euh, selon ce qu'on vous a envoyé. So, so, Vadim, it's okay to us, we can listen to you. Just uh, so you will have a 15 minutes presentation for Mr. Fedelov. After, you, um, oh, sorry, I asked, will ask three, three questions. So, you just need to translate the question. Angel already sent you the, um, the question. Okay, so just translate it to Mr. Fedelov. Thank you very much. Have a good session. Do you have any questions? Vadim, do you, do you hear me? So, yes, but which channel? Okay, I'm now on English. Can you hear me on English? It's on English. Yes. Okay, yes. I don't, I don't see any questions. I, I've got a, a brief um, uh, a brief talking points for the minister, but not the questions. Oh, my colleague Angel sent you three questions. You need to translate okay. to Mr. Federov. She sent you an email like two okay, hours yes, ago. Yes, yes, so maybe can, she will send you now. back can, the no, email right now. I, no, it's fine. I so you will have 15 minutes um, talk, speech talking from Mr. Federov. After okay. our host uh, on stage will ask three questions. You need to translate to Mr. Federov, please. Angel, okay. we send you back the email. Okay, I, I have. She, she, she does. She, she did not do it. I found them already. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So we see you, you. in uh, eight nine minutes. Okay, everything's okay, fine, fine to you. Fine, fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you. Bye. Ich habe meine Kamera jetzt. Schauen. Yes, I see you and hear you.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a nice coffee break. I'm going to make a quick housekeeping note um, to let you know that you can interact with us online. Um, the hashtag for the event is DA22EU. We are also live on YouTube on the Digital EU channel. So for those of you following us online or here in person, don't forget the hashtag. Um, nous passons maintenant en français. Et let us now move uh, to French and to the second plenary of the day on support to Ukraine. Uh, to its connectivity and digital infrastructures. Um, now, it is clear that access and connectivity are vital. People need to get in touch with their closed ones, but the state, the government, and the economy uh, should continue to run smoothly. Long-term, massive efforts will be necessary in order to rebuild the country. Ukraine has asked uh, several times for support to digital, and the tech uh, experts and companies are ready and willing to contribute their support. How to support Ukraine on digital, both in the short and longer terms? So let me give you a brief overview of the session. We're going to start with a live speech and interview with the Ukrainian Vice Prime Minister Fedorov. Then we'll hear speeches from the Commissioner Thierry Breton and Odile Renaud-Basso. Following that, we have a roundtable discussion with CEOs from the tech industry and the director of DigiConnect. Then we'll see a short video announcement um, talking about the launch of the digital tech hub for tech equipment in Slovakia. And lastly, we have a panel discussion on how to meet urgent needs and set the foundation for long-term reconstruction. So as you can see, we have a full uh, session ahead of us, so let's jump right in. And it is now my pleasure to welcome virtually to the stage the Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine, Mikhailo Fedorov. Всім доброго дня. Сподіваюся, мене добре видно і чути. Дякую за можливість сьогодні виступити перед вами. Перш за все, я хотів би подякувати вам за ту підтримку, яку ви сьогодні надаєте нашій країні, за ту підтримку, яка була включена в шостий пакет санкцій. Особливо хотів би відмітити ту допомогу, яку ви надаєте напрямку цифрової трансформації, цифрового відновлення для нашої країни. За цей час ми отримали достатньо допомоги в напрямку телекомунікаційного обладнання. Завдяки цьому ми дуже швидко відновили зв'язок в Київській, Чернігівській області після деокупації. Також в напрямку в напрямку санкцій хотів би подякувати за блокування каналів з російською пропагандою, тому що на сьогодні це окремий вид потужної зброї, і ви нам допомагаєте боротися з тією дезінформацією, яка сьогодні лунає від країни-агресора, від Росії. Також я би хотів окремо подякувати Тірі Бретону за те, що він працює в напрямку боротьби з дезінформацією і підтримує українських громадян в Європейському Союзі, зокрема, в питанні ромінгу. Це дуже важливо для наших громадян, щоб вони залишалися на зв'язку зі своїми родинами. І це дійсно допомагає їм під час перебування в в країнах Європейського Союзу. Також ми зараз працюємо над тим, щоб отримати визнання українських та європейських документів, і я сподіваюся, що цей напрямок також посилить ту співпрацю в цифровому напрямку, яка відбувається між нашими країнами. Також Україна дуже сподівається на те, що ми зможемо приєднатися і ми вже почали над цим працювати, над європейським АМЦМ цифрової ідентифікації. Ви знаєте, що ми маємо такий певний досвід в Україні. Ми стали першою країною, яка прийняла на рівні закону електронні паспорти, вони в нас прирівнені до звичайних хворобих паспортів та бастикових паспортів. І на сьогодні вже майже 17,5 мільйонів українців користуються застосунком ДІА 
який використовують в тому числі для ідентифікації, для використовування електронних паспортів, тому що потребувати паспорт, відкривати рахунки в банках і так далі. Також наша команда працює у засіданнях експертної групи Єврокомісії з питань і IDAS, і у нас також є в цьому напрямку спільні проєкти, і ми активно впроваджуємо всі необхідні інструменти для того, щоб приєднатися до єдиного цифрового ринку. Нещодавно я був в Брюсселі разом з цією командою, і ми Діджі Коннект провели дуже плідну зустріч, і я сподіваюся, що ми зможемо в найближчий час приєднатися до програми Європейського Союзу, це цифрова Європа, яка відкриє для України нові можливості в напрямку цифрової транспорту. А також, я впевнений, що ми окремо внесемо свій цінний, свій вклад в розвиток нових технологій, які дозволять країнам Європейського Союзу швидше пройти шлях цифрової трансформації. За цей час ми дуже багато зробили в напрямку європейської інтеграції в Європейський Союз. І це і розвиток сфери телекомунікації, це прийняття законопроєктів про незалежного регулятора, це і законопроєкт фундаментальний, базовий про телекомунікації. Ми вже в першому читанні прийняли необхідні законопроєкти щодо довірчих послуг і продовжуємо активно працювати над реалізацією дорожньої карти щодо європейської інтеграції, щодо приєднання до європейського ринку. Ви знаєте, що зараз під час війни ми запускаємо дуже багато нових послуг, не зважаючи те, що відбувається війна в нашій країні. Ми кожного тижня запускаємо нову послугу для наших громадян, і ми розуміємо, що цифрова транспорта, Інформація, електронні послуги, електронний уряд є важливою складовою для того, щоб наша країна була більш прозора, більш швидше розвивала свій рівень в ВВП. І ми продовжуємо працювати над цифровою трансформацією. Тому я дякую всім учасникам сьогоднішнього заходу. Я дуже дякую країнам Європейського Союзу за підтримку, яку ви на сьогодні надаєте нашій країні. Ми, знаходячись під постійними кібератаками, продовжуємо розвивати цифрові сервіси. Ми всім показали, що ми вміємо будувати свої захищені інформаційні системи, що ми можемо захищати цифрову інфраструктуру, критичну інфраструктуру, що ми вміємо створювати революційні продукти. І в найближчі кілька років ми зробимо все, щоб відцифрувати всі послуги, які є в нашій країні, відбудувати одну з найзручніших напрямків державних послуг держав у світі. Тому дякую за підтримку і ми, для нас честь, ділитися тим досвідом, який ми отримали під час цифрової трансформації в нашій країні за ці три роки. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vice Prime Minister. Uh, before you go, I would like to ask you just a few questions. First one is, why is Ukraine's digital sector so important to Europe, and why is Europe important to Ukraine? На жаль, ми таки отримали зараз такий досвід, коли під час війни ми будуємо цифрову державу, і я думаю, що зараз і країни Європейського Союзу взагалі весь світ побачив, що є підходи, які працюють в напрямку цифрової трансформації, які можуть переживати війну і впливати позитивно на розвиток держави. І на сьогодні ми маємо унікальний досвід в напрямку побудови кібербезпеки, в напрямку розвитку послуг під час війни. Ми використовуємо технології під час війни для нашого захисту. І це все є унікальним досвідом. Також ми маємо велику кількість, це майже 300 тисяч IT-спеціалістів, які працюють для побудови цифрових урядів цього світу. Спеціалістів, які працюють для для розвитку 
технологічних компаній по цьому світу. І ми також можемо дати свою цінність в напрямку побудови цифрових держав, в напрямку побудови цифрових компаній, технологічних компаній в Європейському Союзі. Тому на сьогодні у нас є певне бачення, як будувати цифрову державу зручну для громадян, робити це дуже швидко. Ми маємо як і ресурси на працювання технологічні конкретні рішення, так і маємо великі спеціалістів, які можуть це робити. Тому ми можемо дати свою цінність європейським країнам і зі свого боку отримати європейський досвід, отримати інші ресурси для того, щоб масштабувати Ті надбання, які вже на сьогодні є в Україні. Дякую. How confident are you that Ukraine can implement these new laws and deliver the necessary reforms? Напрямок цифрової трансформації, він є одним з найсвідчих, де ми виконуємо дорожню карту щодо європейської інтеграції. Наше міністерство його цього трохи більше, ніж два роки. А ми зробили дуже багато для європейської інтеграції, а багатьох напрямках змогли зробити прорив. Тому я думаю, що на сьогодні в нас є такі злі забетонні фактори, які говорять про те, що ми змогли побудувати фундамент цифрової держави, змогли прийняти всі необхідні базові фундаментальні законопроекти. І в нас є чітке бачення, що потрібно зробити для того, щоб євро інтегруватися в Україні в напрямку єдиного цифрового ринку, і що зробити в напрямку побудови зручної держави, в напрямку цифрових сервісів і пост. Тому в нас точно є енергія і чітке розуміння, що нам потрібно робити кожного дня для того, щоб вже приєднатися до Європейського Союзу. And just closing question for you, do you have a final message for our audience here at the Digital Assembly? Uh. Цей тиждень є для нашої країни історичний. Я дуже сподіваюся, що на цьому тижні ми отримаємо вже статус кандидата в Європейський Союз. Я дуже сподіваюся на підтримку всіх наших партнерів з Європейського Союзу. І я впевнений, що ми надамо дуже багато цінності Європейському Союзу і зможемо поділитися комунікацією. і зробити тим все для того, щоб наш світ був безпечний. І ми точно розуміємо, як будувати дуже зручну державу для громадян, навіть під час таких складних ситуацій, які зараз є в нашій країні. Тому для нас дуже важливо, щоб всі продовжували підтримати Україну, продовжували розповідати про Україну, тому що та енергія, яку ми отримуємо, здихає нас Боротися і я впевнений, що дуже скоро ми переможемо. І я дякую всім, хто дотичен до цього і кожного дня робить щось, якусь маленьку справу для того, щоб наша країна перемогла і взагалі свобода перемогла те диктаторство, яке сьогодні є в речі і яке намагається захопити нашу країну. Well, I want to thank you so much um, for being here with us and, and for those powerful words. And um, I can imagine what it's like to find time to be with us despite a war going on. So thank you again for, for joining us at the Digital Assembly. Thank you. Next up on our program, we have a message from the Commissioner for the Internal Market, Thierry Breton. Dear Mr. Fedorov, uh, I'm very sorry uh, not to be able to be with you today, but I wanted to share with you some thoughts for this very important event to lose. The return of war to Europe has been a shock for all of us. Russia's unprovoked military aggression has led to death and destruction 
not to mention the economic distress. We have all been moved by the courage and the resilience of the Ukrainian people. They keep fighting while facing incredibly difficult circumstances. Our absolute priority is and remain helping Ukraine. Since the beginning of this conflict, we have witnessed a remarkable wave of solidarity for Ukraine all over Europe. Last week, the European Commission recommended granting Ukraine official status uh, as a, a, an EU candidate country. There is no doubt. When it comes to digital, Ukraine is already close to the EU. Ukrainian laws on uh, telecoms already reflect the latest EU standards, and I engage personally to ensure that uh, the Ukrainian telecom regulator would become uh, a member of uh, the body of uh, European regulators, BEREC. And thanks to this uh, closeness and uh, to the remarkable uh, joint endeavor of telecom operators, both from the EU and Ukraine, today Ukrainian refugees in almost all Europe benefit from free roaming, SIM cards and rights for international calls. But solidarity with Ukraine runs across the world tech industry. Many digital companies uh, are already providing equipment connectivity and training to refugees, as well as financial support. The EU itself mobilized funding for cyber and digital needs in Ukraine, worth 25 million euros on top of the existing 25 million e-government program. And another 10 million euros will give Ukrainian children access to education, including through digital means. But we know very well that equipment needs are considerable. And this is why, working closely with the team of Vice Prime Minister Fedorov, the Commission teams are actively helping to boost these efforts. Therefore, I would like to make a few announcements today. First, we expect that Ukraine will become uh, associated to our Digital Europe program very soon. This program targets deployment of digital technologies, supercomputers, AI, skills and cybersecurity. It will allow Ukraine to accelerate its uh, digital transformation in line with European values and ambition. Second, I expect that the Connecting Europe Facility Digital Programme will uh, support backbone connectivity between European Union and Ukraine, which is vital for extending the digital single market to Ukraine. And third, I would like to announce the creation of a dedicated digital hub to support Ukraine digital infrastructures. This hub, based in Slovakia, will allow to group the shipment of equipment, making it easier for Ukraine to collect and distribute it where it's needed. Finally, I'm happy to announce today the initiative Tech for Ukraine, a platform bringing together the whole digital sector with the common objective of continued support to Ukraine. I'll call on all European tech companies to help Ukraine in the coming months and stand ready to invest in the rebuilding of the country. Slava Ukraini. Thank you very much. Merci infiniment, Monsieur le... Many, many thanks, uh, Commissioner Breton, for your kind words. I would now like to hand over to Odile Renaud-Basso, who is the chair of the uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Over to you, Mrs. Basso. Thank you for the kind invitation to address today's Digital Assembly and the chance to convey the importance of private sector partnerships in our response to the war on Ukraine. We have been committed to Ukraine's development as a modern democratic nation for 30 years. We are the largest institutional investor in the private sector and one of the most active IFIs. In March, we announced a resilience and livelihood package to support Ukraine and other affected countries. The EBRD's aim is to ensure that the economy and private sector keep running and to support vital infrastructure such as electricity and railways network. We plan to invest 1 billion euros in Ukraine in 2022 as our immediate response. Building the foundations for digital transformation is one of the EBRD's key strategic priorities. This was our ambition before the invasion and remains so today. 
accelerating the transition to a more digital economy, promoting adaptation among industry and public organizations, encouraging innovation and inclusion. The EBRD is a reliable partner to channel your pledged support to the economy of Ukraine. We will work very closely with the European Commission to support the development of technology and digital in Ukraine. The reconstruction, when it begins, will be the biggest challenge that development finance has faced in recent decades. The EBRD multilateral setting with Ukraine, EU and G7 represented in our governance gives the EBRD a unique role. This crisis highlights why the international community needs to act coherently and collaboratively. Let's continue working together in this spirit. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, President. Thank you very much, uh, President uh, Renaud Basso. For the next roundtable discussion, we have a short video um, on the support that digital operators are providing to Ukraine. Uh, Commissaire Breton just mentioned it. Um, the European Commission created a platform. It's called Tech for UA, and it's open to companies, NGOs, local authorities, and even citizens who are supporting initiatives to support Ukraine through digital. Um, already they've managed to attract a great number of pledges and we have a few of them featured in this video. Let's check it out. Since the war began in Ukraine, there's been an unprecedented wave of solidarity for refugees within all orange subsidiaries in Europe. Our teams, from marketing to technical, sales and IT, have immediately sprung into action. From day one, we dropped the cost of calls and SMS from our eight European countries to Ukraine to help Ukrainians keep in touch with their friends and families. Since then, we have also enabled free roaming inside Ukraine. For families fleeing their country, we are distributing hundreds of thousands of free prepaid SIM cards, and we have installed free Wi-Fi access in refugee welcome centers. We have also opened call centers and emergency helplines for humanitarian aid associations. And to support the increase in traffic, we have increased network capacity, especially along the borders. The war against Ukraine started on the 24th of February. A few days later, European telcos started offering free services and SIM cards to incoming refugees. Today, there are 4.9 million Ukrainians in the EU, and I'm proud to say that the telcos are helping them stay connected. At Cisco, we have been supporting Ukraine and Ukrainian people in many different ways. We have been providing networking equipment for free to Ukrainian government, supporting connectivity, and also working with nonprofit organizations to support connectivity in refugee centers via Wi Fi. We've also been leveraging our cybersecurity expertise through our Talos team, sharing threat intelligence and also offering security products for free to Ukrainian organizations. took several initiatives for the people of Ukraine as of the start of this crisis. First of all, we made sure our customers could call and text for free from and to Ukraine. And we later joined the European initiative to reduce roaming tariffs. We're supporting Ukrainian people with fighting fake news, with technical support of equipment and software that was requested and provided by uh, ICT and to the communication business, businesses in Poland. We have been encouraging and helping our members, especially those vendors of fiber equipment, to bring material support to Ukrainian operators. And we welcome and actively support the initiative 
from the European Commission to coordinate and reinforce this effort essential for the resilience of Ukraine telecom infrastructures. Digital Europe has really been uh, very, very uh, supported towards Ukraine. This attack from Russia has come as a big surprise for many of us and uh, we are doing as an industry everything we can help uh, to support the Ukrainian IC society and of course the society as a whole. Since the start of the invasion of Ukraine, the GSMA has been working with its key members to ensure a coordinated industry response. The GSMA actions are focused on four main pillars, supporting humanitarian assistance, EU engagement on the policy response, supporting networks and cyber threat coordination. They're fleeing the war. Some have nowhere to go. Others have planned for the future transport and destination. We help them warm up, recharge their phones. We help them complete the equipment they will need for their future travel. We give them food, clothing, toiletries, basic products for their children. These people are deeply disoriented. They don't know what they're doing here, and they need to keep in touch with their families. <laughs> Yeah, we can applaud that. That was pretty amazing. Oui, vraiment, ça mérite. And we'll continue to see um, about massive contributions uh, throughout the, the next roundtables. So let's move right into our next roundtable and welcome our participants who are all connecting in today. We have online Roberto Viola, the Director General of DG Connect. Oh, we have everybody there. So Thomas Renaud, CEO of Iliad. Richard Marco, the CEO of Asset, and Jean-Marc Arion, the CEO of Play. Welcome, you guys. Hope you guys can see me. I can see you, in any case. Um, I see some nods of heads, so that's great. Um, I have some, uh, a few questions. I'd love to get to all of them, so if we keep our answers short, we can do that. Um, and I will start with you, uh, Mr. Viola. In your policy work with Ukraine, you've always taken a dynamic approach. I'm thinking of, for example, the alignment with EU digital acquis. How do you think we can best support Ukraine in moving forward? And uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you, although online. And into Tech for Ukraine platform, it's really, I mean, uh, uh, rewarding to see many of you contributing and also thank the panelists uh, to, to join us in this effort. Ukraine, uh, before the aggression of Russia, uh, was really going into a remarkable path of digitalization. And especially uh, there was uh, quite an impulse in making every public service easily accessible online. And this, in a way, it's an asset also during these tragic times. So our effort is concentrated in uh, helping our Ukrainian friends to keep digitizing the economy and the society, because ex exactly in this kind of emergency, this helps. For instance, I mean, uh, by making sure that electronic documents can be exchanged, uh, that uh, electronic identification means can work. And of course, I mean, uh, supporting uh, through this platform and other means uh, to make the uh, digital ecosystem more resilient. In, in this respect, uh, it's important uh, uh, to remark, as I said at the very beginning, the efforts that many contributors are doing I like to highlight in particular, I mean, the agreement uh, to actually support Ukraine in terms of uh, free roaming equipments. This commitment, uh, it's a commitment that, that is still uh, ongoing. It's valid for the next three months. And uh, we hope that this uh, kind of uh, voluntary commitment uh, can be renewed in the uh, following period. That's very important. 
We will also help with the structural funding. Already, I mean, millions of euros have been going in the direction of Ukraine for concern cybersecurity, for concern, I mean, uh, e-government. And, of course, we look also at the possibly uh, much brighter future in terms of reconstruction and working with international partners in this respect. But now is the time, really, to be together to support our Ukrainian friends, and that's why we welcome very much uh, the participation to this panel and the overwhelming participation to our Tech for Ukraine plan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for your continued support. So, turning to you now, uh, Richard Marco. Um, Major crises, as history always teaches us, tend to be really unforgiving teachers. And obviously the situation in Ukraine is on a completely different level. What uh, lessons is the war teaching us about cybersecurity today? Well, uh, we have to realize that uh, there are actually two wars or maybe war, maybe more but two wars being fought at the same time so one directly on the field the other one in cyber cyber domain and this war didn't start uh, during this year but it actually started earlier most importantly in in 2014 so since then uh, ukraine was uh, perhaps the most challenging cyber security area in the whole world and some of the biggest cyber security threats for Ukraine but also for other parts of the world. Remember for example um, NotPetya, the biggest um, ransomware attack that was affecting the whole world, it all originated in Ukraine. Now ESSET is uh, is the largest cybersecurity vendor in Ukraine. So we are directly in this uh, battlefield. And uh, the invasion started in uh, February 24. But in the evening of February 23, we noticed that there is a big cyber attack going on in Ukraine and we published a news. Then a couple of hours later, the whole invasion uh, started. And this hasn't ended uh, back then. So uh, we saw several waves of large cyber, cyber security attacks on Ukraine since then. And so it is our work and of course of anybody who is trying to help Ukraine in this fight to help to secure uh, the Ukrainian IT infrastructure uh, in different ways. Uh, the whole economy is uh, heavily affected by the crisis. We see around 30% decline in the overall IT activity in Ukraine since then. But uh, we from our side are trying to provide as much help as possible, extending uh, the licenses that we are providing to the customers there, providing free upgrades to the uh, most um, um, uh, the most sophisticated solutions and so on. So I, I guess there are there are different ways that we can do, but this cybersecurity field is one of the big battlefields of uh, of the war in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Um, and like you said, it's hard work. So uh, we really wish you the best uh, with all of that. I'd like to turn now to uh, Thomas Renaud. Um, do you think you could tell us um, what is Iliad and how come you guys are involved in Ukraine? I would like to start on a personal note. Uh, it happens that I was in Kiev with uh, the Iliad management team just a few days before the beginning of the war. And uh, in addition to the beauty of the architecture of Kiev, to the beauty of uh, the city, uh, we, the management team of Iliad, were all struck by the tech ecosystem, the entrepreneurs we met, the startup that we visit and uh, also with a young, well-trained and educated population that is looking towards Europe. And Kiev is probably the most uh, telling demonstration of that change of Ukraine over the last decade. And I was very interested by the speech of uh, 
Mr. Fedorov. And it happens that Mr. Fedorov is the vice prime minister of Ukraine, but is also uh, the minister of digital transformation. And it's a unique case uh, in Europe when you see a, a vice prime minister also in charge of a digital transformation. So it tells a lot about uh, the real nature of the country. Uh, on top of that, we quite often say that uh, in our world of telecom, among telecom experts, that telecoms are vital infrastructure. And I can tell you that uh, that word vital has never been so true because this is thanks to our to the networks, thanks to the fact that Ukraine is interconnected to its European neighbors, Poland, Romania, with a unique uh, fiber uh, interconnection that enabled at the beginning to avoid a telecom blackout and to make sure that the telecom networks play a very central role in the war, in the capability of the Ukrainian people to communicate between themselves, but also to uh, resist. And uh, I can tell you that I was really uh, impressed by the reaction of uh, our Polish uh, employees at play. And Jean-Marc Arion, our CEO, will give you more details from the ground with a unique mobilization in order to provide to the Ukrainian refugees uh, some uh, free of charge uh, telecommunication. And uh, we had more than half a million uh, refugees that used our, ne uh, our network. But I think that uh, we need to think about what next, what is going to happen tomorrow when the war will be open. And we do hope that it will happen sooner than uh, later. And uh, I can tell you that the Elian team will bring all its uh, technical cooperation at the same time, the expertise and its uh, experience. And that uh, on top of that, the construction, reconstruction of Ukraine will not be the same Ukraine. It will be a kind of new Ukraine. I'm pretty sure that uh, the European public authorities will uh, mobilize themselves. But what is also important is uh, the private sector, the private initiatives, uh, the access to capital, the access uh, uh, to debt also for the amazing Ukrainian entrepreneurs that uh, we met. So when I'm uh, thinking about those few days spent in Kiev in February, uh, I'm optimistic when the days will come to rebuild uh, Ukraine. Uh, thank you so much, Thomas. Um, and we will definitely get into what um, Play is doing on the ground and, and you know, sort of what the exact efforts are um, to support Ukraine. But before we do, um, you know, you mentioned reconstruction and we're talking about cybersecurity and how it's really a huge part of the war that's maybe less visible. And so my next question is for Jean-Marc. Um, you know, when we talk about reconstruction, we can literally see that schools, hospitals, and homes need urgent attention. It, it's, it's obvious. Um, for the digital part that's less visible, m less tangible maybe, um, why is it also really important to support the reconstruction in Ukraine? Yes, I believe that um, the, the, one of the lessons that we learn uh, from uh, our Ukrainian uh, colleagues and the Ukrainian people is definitely not only the the courage and the resilience that they demonstrate during this war, but as well uh, the importance they were giving from day one to the the maintain of their uh, telecommunication infrastructure. And as a matter of fact, uh, this war has probably been the the first one, at least uh, uh, around Europe or in Europe in this case, uh, that uh, where where the, the the, the, the telecommunication service have been proven to be not only vital, as uh, mentioned by Thomas, but as well strategic, a strategic weapons in the in the hands of the of the government. So, from day one, we have seen uh, the tremendous efforts paid by the uh, spent by the, the the telecommunication operators in Ukraine to maintain their infrastructure, and um, I believe that this is where we we can we can learn from from the future because. We have been in touch with them in play from day one. We were the, the first operator to react in Europe. So six hours after the beginning of the war, uh, we had uh, uh, started offering uh, uh, free calls to, to Ukraine. When we saw the first refugees crossing the border, we sent uh, uh, 
the, the first uh, volunteers, uh, 200, 300 on the border, two, three days after the beginning of the war, opening new, new sites. Today, we have still uh, 600,000 uh, Ukrainians using our services to call back to, to Ukraine. Uh, and, um, and that, of course, gives, an, uh, gives us a lot of proximity with the operators. And one of the things we did, and I believe it's, uh, I don't want to disclose too many details for security reasons, but one of the things we did, uh, uh, especially during the two first months of the, of the war, uh, was to support uh, the three operators, each of one in a different way, to organize the backup of their platform. And as well, of course, to uh, send uh, convoys with equipment in order to rebuild uh, uh, the platform that has been destroyed. Uh, so the sending of material was uh, critical because uh, uh, the, the road between uh, uh, between Sheshouf and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Lviv and Kiev was the only one uh, usable to uh, to send equipment, uh, telecom equipment there. So we sent many convoys starting from Morso and, and Rechouf. But um, on top of that, and I believe this is uh, probably more important uh, uh, for, for the future. We, we saw that uh, the, the the mobile operators in uh, in Ukraine have very quickly decided to uh, share the traffic each with the others. So organizing a kind of mutual roaming uh, between the networks in order to uh, uh, to carry uh, the three operators' traffic on the three uh, on the three networks, and then they organize some uh, external backup. So we organize, uh, for instance, uh, VMware uh, platforms backup for some operators. Uh, a lot of alternative. We built alternative radio controllers to uh, be able to carry the traffic outside of the network in case of emergency. Uh, thanks to that. Uh, in the in the first months of the of the conflict, uh, they've been able to rebuild very rapidly their platform. So um, I believe that when we think about what we can do in the future to uh, organize the communication in case of emergency, <clears throat> the lesson here is that uh, we need to organize and to to be ready to organize the the, the the sharing in emergency of our networks rather than to build a dedicated infrastructure. And this is, of course, uh, valuable as well for the, the public services, because uh, what is done for the, the military purpose and for the government purpose can be used for any kind of public infrastructure, for the hospital. For the... So it's about sharing the, the, the infrastructure, sharing the, 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 the spectrum, organizing the, the virtual backup uh, in uh, different geographies. And of course, uh, nothing can be done without the, the courage and the and uh, the involvement of these uh, amazing colleagues of us uh, that works in uh, uh, Ukrainian operators and who have uh, worked days and, and, and nights uh, in very difficult condition to maintain the, 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 the telecommunication networks alive on air and help the population to communicate each with the other, which has been proven to be one of the most efficient weapons used by the Ukrainian resistance. Well, thank you so much for telling us about all your efforts uh, on the ground. Maybe we could hear about um, your company's uh, contribution. Richard, uh, I know that you guys are also helping Ukraine in the digital sphere. You mentioned uh, the mission of your company, but uh, maybe you could give us a little bit more details about the support you're providing in digital to Ukraine. Well, the the support is um, providing the uh, directly the equipment and uh, the software, the solutions. This is being uh, done according to the needs that are there. But really, we need to realize that uh, we are providing um, security solutions to both households and small small and medium uh, businesses and also the big enterprise businesses. So I would say uh, the thing that is really significant is co cooperation and coordination of uh, these efforts with the local authorities and local experts like CERT Ukraine. And this is this is the way to uncover the attacks as soon as possible. We need to realize that uh, uh, the attacks are directly, directly on um, critical infrastructure like power stations. So it's not only about shelling that we sometimes see in television, 
but uh, the cyber attacks going uh, in parallel or usually preceding uh, such attacks. And so they, you know, we need to keep track uh, and an eye on what is going on because these attacks are related. Usually one is used to help the next wave and so on. Uh, the latest wave that, that was directly against the power, power stations was, I believe, in uh, April, and it, it was actually prevented. So there was not a direct uh, blackout as a consequence of this, which was very, very uh, big achievement, I would say, of the teams in Ukraine and our teams. Then, of course, uh, there is all the help that we do, just like many other companies. Several of our offices are located close to Ukrainian border. So, so then this is the work of volunteers and uh, some of them are taking uh, the families fleeting from Ukraine to their own houses and apartments. Well, thank you so much, Richard, and thank you uh, to all of our panelists. Good work on preventing that, that last blackout. Um, uh, to close uh, this session, Mr. Viola, do you have any final words that you'd like to share with our panelists, with everybody here in Toulouse, with everybody connected live online? Um, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to reiterate uh, my thanks to the Iliad group to play for the work. Uh, I second the words of Mr. Richard on uh, the uh, skillful operation by Ukraine uh, in terms of uh, handling uh, threats. And uh, as I said, and was said by the panelists, uh, we really have uh, partners in Ukraine that uh, can manage digital issues. And I think they deserve uh, our help for many reasons. Uh, and of course, uh, we will not be shy in helping. We will be, I'm sure, all of us very generous in our help. Good. Well, that's good news uh, for all of us. Thank you so much for uh, being here, and thank you for all your hard work. So we're going to move on to our next panel now. Um, that was really inspiring. Um, and before we do, uh, we have a short video announcement um, announcing the launch of the Digital Tech Hub. Um, so the Digital Tech Hub facilitates donations of tech equipment from the private sector to Ukraine. And they have a hub based in Slovakia. And they're going to show us a little bit more uh, the work they're doing in this video. In our previous panel and throughout the various announcements that we have seen and heard this afternoon, we can see different initiatives to support Ukraine. And we're going to continue along this same theme um, with this next roundtable, how the tech industry can help Ukraine during and after the war. So for that, let's welcome on stage our panelists. Um, we have Gulsana Mamedieva, the Director General of the Dictorate of European Integration in the Ministry for Digital Transformation for Ukraine. Yacek Kubas, the Director of the Digital Hub, EBRD. 
Jakob Greiner, Vice President of European Affairs, Deutsche Telekom, Andrew Lee, the Director of Government Affairs for OSET, and we also have a number of panelists online, so let's welcome them with a big round of applause. Alexander Zivantovsky, Chairperson of NCEC, which is the Ukrainian telecoms regulator. Angelika Vinstig, Member of European Parliament from European People's Party in Austria. And finally, Pavel Lewandowski, Under Secretary of State in the Chancellery of the Prime Minister of Poland. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, so I'd like to kick off this panel with you, Gulsana uh, Mamedieva, uh, and first of all, just to say thank you so much for traveling all the way to Toulouse today. I know that it's really not simple to travel from uh, a country in the middle of a war, so we really appreciate you being here. Um, do you think you could describe the extent of the impact of the war so far on Ukraine's digital infrastructure? And also, for all of us, just tell us what are the top needs? It's, it's working, okay. Um, in terms of impact on digital infrastructure, uh, I would uh, maybe here speak in, in, in broad sense. Yes, digital infrastructure meaning telecom, connectivity, also registers, and uh, state possess um, critical infrastructure. Uh, of course, this is the first target uh, of the uh, attacks by Russian uh, militaries. And uh, we have seen and uh, continued was said before here that along with or short time prior the physical attack, what is going on, it's a going attack on the critical infrastructure in uh, and digital infrastructure and telecom infrastructure. So um, what, like as an illustration on the workshop today, uh, early this morning, I was showing the picture of the data center, uh, state data center that was hit it and destroyed the first days of war. Uh, so this is, the impact is, is uh, we are keeping the numbers updated, yes, and I think the uh, telecom regulator will uh, give the, uh, they prepared the fresh numbers about uh, the damage uh, on, on the connectivity infrastructure, but it's really hard to, assess uh, because it's, uh, uh, we don't know what is happening on occupied territories. Yes, we, uh, we only assess like the situation in the occupied territories. So generally I would say, and, and going about the needs um, in terms of urgent needs, this is the first, the registries, because we continue deploying new public services uh, in terms of war, in time of war, it's more needed uh, for to provide actually convenient public services to, uh, for Ukrainians, and uh, this is absolute must. So this is a security and uh, of state registers. Of course, it's uh, as I said, development of public services in India. We want to continue, and uh, we're already actually showing the result. We deployed several public services uh, during the war. Um, we plan to deploy more than 100 uh, this year, uh, plus uh, public services also with a big priority on social services because we have five and a five million actually refugee people, uh, Ukrainians seeking protection outside of Ukraine. Yes, in, mostly in European Union and Polish and neighboring, uh, Poland and neighboring countries and also seven millions internally displaced. Uh, person, so this is a social protectionism is absolutely a must. So we want to make and uh, reconsider making one electronic unified system for social protection. Uh, also, creation a data backup center because this is a crucial. Absolutely, it's not possible to develop and and move further with uh, building digital state. And we have um, actually five. Um, top priority register that we want to and need to back up. Mm, and also, of course, cybersecurity and uh, restore the telecom infrastructure. So this is a, actually, I would say that he has a full range of digital sector is a priority now. Okay, great. Well, hopefully uh, during this panel and during these next couple of days, we can, um, you know, just really support those initiatives moving forward. Um, so turning to you now online, Angelika Winstig, 
Why is it important for the EU and other institutions to invest in Ukraine? And, you know, listening to the top priorities uh, that we just heard, what do you think should be the main actions of a potential digital reconstruction plan? We might have a we might have a little bit of um, a delay, but that's okay. We'll stay online because we're already facing this way. So, um, question for you, Alexander: um, How has the industry managed to keep Ukraine connected? Um, and what are the lessons learned from an operational and a regulatory point of view? Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, while we get that figured out, that's the beauty of live events, um, we kind of get uh, some of those uh, bugs in there, but I'm sure our tech team is working on that. So uh, turning to you now, uh, Jacek, what are um, the strengths of Ukraine in innovation and modern technology? Um, we've talked, you know, Iliad was saying how impressed they were being on the ground there. Um, and how can the EBRD participate in nurturing this further? Question. I hope you can hear me. I think there are a number of, of amazing strengths uh, in terms of the uh, innovation and digitalization in Ukraine, right? Let's first of all uh, talk about the talent, right? And uh, talking about the Ministry of Digitalization itself, the startup scenes, the companies, I think that's something that human capital that should not be uh, neglected. Then the other element around this is that they are building the technologies, utilizing the existing technologies really to progress and I would say leapfrog in their development as, as a country. And I think that's really beauty to observe uh, also working as a development organization like ours. And I don't know how many of you know what EBRD is and what, what we do, but we are owned by governments, including by European Union, but we are a private sector focused bank. So we lend around 10 billion euro a year. And until the war in Ukraine, we're actually the biggest private sector lender in Ukraine, lending 1 billion euro a year. So we really did work closely with a number of companies uh, uh, in Ukraine, including on digital. Because in terms of the priorities of our lending activities, we have at the moment three. One is around green, the other one is around inclusivity, and the third element is digital. And uh, what we actually are going to be doing in Ukraine also um, this year, and you have heard our president speaking here early on, is we are committed to invest one billion till the end of this year. And many of those projects will be around also digital infrastructure, uh, critical infrastructure, energy security, food security. We all know what the priorities at the moment are. But I think what I take personally from, from working with Ukrainian businesses and companies is how develop on the digital scale they really, um, really are. And I think that's something that us as a bank are very happy to work with the commission, but also private sector and private sector donors to really channel the funds to Ukraine and be able to be part of the reconstruction efforts because we've been there for the last 30 years and we are not walking away because the situation is difficult. We are there to continue to be trusted partners. Well, great, thank you so much, and, and obviously thank you for your, your support in that. Um, Jakob, so we've heard a lot from telecoms about the support, about um, you know waiving roaming fees and distributing prepaid uh, cards. Do you think there's anything else uh, telecom providers can do to help the situation in Ukraine? Yeah, first of all, let me say that it, it could be me representing Deutsche Telekom here, but as we've seen in all the pledges, it, uh, it, I think I can speak for the whole sector who, um, and if you allow me to reflect a little bit on the past um, weeks, who did, uh, in my view, um, uh, a really a tremendous job in um, making sure that um, not only on the side of 
the Ukraine um, networks stay as resilient as they can, but also to ease and to facilitate communication by all those affected. And, and to give you some examples from my uh, company's perspective, which I'm sure counts for all of those who, who we've seen today, is that really from the start, um, we immediately temporarily got rid of uh, charges that we normally charge with each other, with the Ukrainian operators and us, if, for example, Ukrainian refugees, and we've heard there were many and are many, are leaving the country and are roaming. And by that, we wanted to be sure that these benefits can be passed on to the Ukrainians so that they can have affordable uh, and actually parts also even free connectivity. And it has been mentioned uh, before, uh, and I'm sure Angelika Winzig will also talk about it, with the help of the European Parliament, but especially also with the European Commission, we managed um, in April to come to a joint statement and let's say a, a mutual commitment both on the side of Ukrainian operators and European operators to lower the charges reciprocal on both sides so that in the end, as I said, the benefit will be to those who need to make calls, who need to uh, use data. And, and uh, you know, I think we not only from the pandemic, pandemic we have seen that uh, connectivity is really the lifeline of not only digital transformation, but society. And uh, we need to now make sure um, in the months ahead, uh, because I'm sure this war will unfortunately probably not end tomorrow, to continue these efforts voluntarily um, that have been initiated uh, by the actions of operators, but also by this joint statement, and really see if by that we can yeah, facilitate uh, connectivity um, on the way ahead. Now, last point, we've seen also the, um, the idea of a digital hub uh, and also donations of equipment. Um, here, um, you know, all operators are looking into what they can donate. We have a bit of a challenge here because normally telecom operators, um, you know, really order the equipment at short notice from manufacturers. They don't have a lot sitting in their shelves and if, then it's for resilience purposes. But I believe uh, we will all um, try to look and see what we can bring to the table and especially also manufacturers, I'm sure, uh, as we've heard already um, from some here, will be happy to contribute. Yeah. So it sounds like it's a really a joint effort, everyone on the ground, um, really trying to make that more accessible. And you're right, it's been brought into major evidence how important it is to stay connected and keep those lines of communication open. Um, so turning to you now, Andrew, it's something that um, I found really fascinating in our CEO panel with Richard saying that it's almost like there's two wars going on. There's the physical war, but there's also the cyber war. Um, and it can also be very, sort of give clues as to what's going to be attacked next because they've had incidents just before um, physical attacks. Um, this is sort of our first full-scale cyber war that we're seeing in Europe. What do you think we can learn from it to be better protected in the future, um, are there specific actions from the private or the public sector that we need to take into account? Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's right. Uh, it it is probably the first, at least publicly, uh, you know, major cyber war. However, if we look back to um, Estonia in tw in 2007. Yeah, they, they did suffer very large-scale cyber attacks and since that moment then developed the skills that were needed and Estonia really now is a world leader in, in cyber security. So, uh, you know, and, and as, uh, as Richard said at the beginning of uh, his, his first intervention, you know, Ukraine uh, has been under attack since, since before 2014, actually, around 2013. We started to see the rise and then through the years, Prior to, of course, the uh, the, the sort of uh, the troubles uh, that were happening already in Donbas region, there were major blackouts in 2016. There were major blackouts in 2015, and ongoing there has been activity uh, of of certainly Russian-speaking actors in Ukraine, causing disruption, causing destruction and trying to undermine critical national infrastructure. And that has brought us to the situation now where actually. As, as Richard said, some things are able to be prevented, and this is really a credit to the skills that the Ukrainian government uh, and the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian IT people, have built themselves. 
Uh, and you know, the, the, it's, it's important to remember that we are not, uh, we are not simply the great saviors marching into Ukraine and delivering our, you know, our wonderful expertise, but we are really partnering with what expertise there is on the ground already, and we have a tremendous amount to learn from what Ukraine has done. And to answer your question about what can we learn from, from, from Ukraine in Europe, it is exactly that, to invest heavily into cyber resilience, in he invest heavily into the IT sector. The IT sector in, in Ukraine, prior to, of course, the invasion in February in the last year, grew around 36%. It's a tremendous amount of growth in, and a tremendous amount of opportunity and a huge amount of skill that is being driven by the fact that they are under attack. And so perhaps Europe can learn without having to be under this direct attack, that we also should invest in digital skills, we should also invest in platforms that are resilient, that are well audited, that are uh, properly interoperable, and we should have these kind of uh, agreements to partner with, with each other as European members and as hopefully future European members to, to work together to actually create a digitally resilient situation for all of us. Thank you so much. Um, I, there's a number of things I want to come back to, but I think that we might have our virtual participants who are with us, and I wanted to bring them into uh, the conversation. So um, I think we have uh, Pavel Lewandowski um, with us. I see a nod of your head. Great. Um, so uh, I'd like to ask you, in light of the war in Ukraine, what um, good practices have emerged around fighting disinformation? Um. Uh, first of all, thank you for having uh, us here, for holding this very important, important, um, very important conference here about Ukraine, about uh, about the war and everything that that's connected with it. And um, in terms of our um, experience in fighting the um, in cyber sphere. Uh, we provided uh, our um, media companies with some uh, money and some um, resources to show to to give them um, to give them some uh, some um, facilities to 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 fight the, the war uh, the cyber war uh, according to according to a certain plan uh, our state owned uh, companies such as uh, such as polish television such as polish press agency uh, had introduced and established new uh, service called Fake Hunter, and Fake Hunter is a service that verifies every disinformation uh, that is shown uh, within the internet. And uh, other Polish uh, Polish um, companies, such as uh, National uh, National Agency Academic Agency uh, for the Internet, um, has also provided us uh, provided to the country and uh, the society. Uh, with uh, some hashtags that uh, are always shown whenever uh, the information in cybersphere, especially in social media, appears uh, with uh, misinformation, with disinformation, uh, and with some other very in dangerous content uh, that is spread by the Russian intelligence service. Uh, so that these are the main things that we do right now, because the only way to uh, handle the disinformation is to provide more reliable information from reliable sources. So we want to provide those reliable sources. We want to uh, we want to um, uh, mark them uh, to be uh, very easily um, distinguished from other sources. Uh, and uh, this is the first step in fighting the cyber war. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and so now if we are back with Angelika. Um, the question I'd asked before, maybe you heard, because I saw you start to answer, but um, was about investing in Ukraine and why it's important for institutions to invest in Ukraine. Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation. Yes, investing in the Ukraine is a win-win situation for member states as well as for the Ukraine, because we have many similarities. We have common values. Uh, the European way of life, and we both have well-educated population, and the focus on digitalization and digital transformation. Uh, a big advantage of the Ukraine are, of course, the important natural resources. Uh, there have already been a lot of investments before the war, 
for example, my small country with 9 million inhabitants, Austria, has 400 private companies with locations in the Ukraine. And I'm convinced that there will be a lot of future investments after the war, especially if the Ukraine is granted candidate status. And during the war, the European Parliament will support the Ukraine. Thank you so much. Um, and now going over to you, Alexander. Um, you know, uh, Andrew mentioned that uh, we've really, it's been a partnership with the expertise on the ground uh, in Ukraine and that you guys have done a remarkable job of being resilient and putting into place, you know, really mobilizing the expertises. What has worked well and what has not worked so well from a regulatory point of view and an operational point of view of staying connected? All right, thank you very much for uh, having me here. Can you hear me well now? Um, my name is Alexander Zivotovsky, and I'm uh, head of a local telecom authority. We are responsible for the connectivity part of the di digital uh, infrastructure. And I'd like to share with you uh, a thought that, uh, that occurred to me when, I, when I'm looking at the numbers that, uh, that relate to the damage to the infrastructure that we are facing. The digital infrastructure throughout our societies, and it's in any society, both in Ukraine and in any European or American country, the digital infrastructure has become so much a part of the society itself that uh, that uh, it is, uh, you know, it, it, it is a part of it that cannot be separated from it because people stay connected through it. People do some basic things like uh, I don't know, buying online and then communicating with each other. But also some very, you know, very important things like equal access to information or cyber security or physical security, even education and so on and so forth, voting. Yeah. And uh, uh, when I look at the numbers, uh, my, my, my colleague Gulsana said that uh, you know, I'll, I'll name the numbers of the damage that we're having here, uh, that all of the numbers like number of base stations destroyed, it's 3000, but you know, when you look at these numbers as a percentage of a, of a total, they all relate to to a simple um, uh, to a simple figure, to a percentage of a territory that is being under attack now. So it's one fifth in every in every number. The you know the percentages go from you know twenty, around twenty percent, which means and then, you know again underlines that uh, that uh, the digital infrastructure and telecom infrastructure is a, is a part of the society as a whole. Um, Having said that, because we were facing this challenge and because we were facing a physical destruction of infrastructure in, in the war zones, we, we actively engaged uh, with, uh, with the operators uh, in, uh, in the things that we can do to improve connectivity. Things like uh, national roaming, we introduced it within Ukraine. Things like uh, reduce roaming tariffs, and I'm thankful for the for my colleagues from the previous panel session from the Euro, for Euro, European operators and our operators. We and the leadership of the European Commission and, and the Berec in uh, in uh, preparing the joint uh, uh, statement uh, which we've done some months ago to reduce the traffic and 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 allow for for free uh, uh, communication for for the Ukrainians fleeing the war. We were throwing in a spectrum, a new spectrum that were, was supposed to be auctioned before the war. We let the operators use it, uh, you know, for the time being, uh, for free. And all of these initiatives, uh, uh, all of the initiatives that that we undertook, I must say that uh, again, you know, speaking on the broader picture, and uh, when we say that about one fifth of the of the territory and the digital infrastructure is, is being attacked and uh, and in some places it's totally destroyed in some places we don't know that but it also means that 80 percent of the infrastructure and 80 percent of the uh, of the connectivity is is still working and we are the working day to day uh, with our colleagues from ministry of digital transformation and the operators and our european partners to, uh, to bring back to the goals, the, the ambitious goals that we had uh, before the war. Because as I started uh, from where I started, I end where I started, because the uh, digital infrastructure is so much an integral part of the society, uh, it has been 
primary focus for our government and our president on uh, you know the rebuilding or, or you know improving the service improving the connectivity improving the coverage improving all of the you know, bringing on all of the all of the great uh, you know projects that our ministry of digital transformation mr Fedorov, is bringing on it was, it was a great focus before the war and uh, and uh, while we are at war it remains uh, it remains uh, a key priority as well Having said that, uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, everyone, for having us here. I'd like to thank Commissioner Breton for, the, for his leadership. I'd like to thank all of, all of, the, all of our friends in the European Commission, our Polish friends, uh, um, uh, for our friends from Berek, where, as you might know, we are now a non-voting member. And, uh, and finish off with saying that, uh, that, uh, that digital transformation is a key is the key in peace and is the key at war because there is nothing more valuable to any person on earth now than ability to to connect and to hear your loved one uh, and uh, know that he's uh, or she is 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 well thank you Thank you, Alexander, and you're thanking us, but I'd also like to thank you uh, for connecting during uh, war and finding time to really share what's going on um, on the ground and, and all the efforts that you're making. So uh, thank you for, for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I'd like to circle back now um, to Andrew. So what needs to be done to strengthen cybersecurity? And if you know the answer, um, what can we learn from Ukraine? I think there are probably many, many answers to that, but I'll try to be to very simple. You know, the, the, we, we're very focused on this, the current situation, and rightly so. You know, Ukraine is under attack. There has been a, a completely outrageous invasion of their territory, not only in terms of their, their, their land, but in terms of their cyber territory, the autonomy of them to run and, and to run their own uh, infrastructure and to run their own systems. And this is something which, as, as cybersecurity companies, you know, we take extremely seriously. We protect these, you know, digital world as it were. So, but we also should remember that in the wider world, uh, there is an ongoing cyber conflict and there are groups around, adversarial groups around the rest of the world who are also now turning their attention to, to Europe. They're, they're turning their attention in some cases to Ukraine. Um, and these are also forces with, uh, you know, interest in the cyber realm, but also perhaps in, in, in the long-term planning. We are talking about, you know, how can we, how can we plan for the future? What can we do once peacetime comes? And I hope, you know, every uh, every day that that will be very soon. But what can we do then to to rebuild Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian infrastructure and so on? But there will be other agencies and other countries looking to also perhaps offer their services in rebuilding those things. But what does that? Do, what does that come with? What does, what does that introduce? And we can look at perhaps Africa as an example of what's being built there in the way that debt is leveraged, in the way that capital is provided, and in the way the infrastructure is provided, which perhaps doesn't necessarily match with, with the, the aspirations of a country that wants to come to a, a democratic relationship within Europe. So we, we have to consider the cyber realm as part of this. And so what can we do is I think there is a great need not only for uh, better partnership between the private sector and the, and the government sector in cybersecurity, that has increased tremendously since, since, uh, since February and has been increasing over the, over the years. Um, but I, and I also have to give credit to, you know, to companies uh, that we've partnered with, companies like Microsoft, companies like the telecoms industry, but also, uh, but also you know, agencies like uh, Digital Europe, where they've been able to coordinate these large-scale efforts for bringing together expertise, not just equipment and money, but expertise on how we can tackle these things. And I think cyber in Europe is far stronger than perhaps people even realize that it is. And this is something that we don't necessarily only need to rely on the outside. And so Europe can focus its public-private partnerships, perhaps, on what do we already have here in Europe, including in Ukraine, the skills and, uh, that's already available, and, and, and the, the kind of uh, the uniqueness of our offering of what we have, of the skills we have, our position in the world geographically, economically, and from a cyber threat intelligence point of view, how we're installed, how we, what we can see, the telemetry that we're able to gain by where we are. As, as Richard said, you know, we're, we're the largest supplier in, in Ukraine of cybersecurity uh, solutions. So we have a completely unique view 
which is only possible because of these kind of collaborative approaches. So I think cyber, cyber threat intelligence is a really big important part and, and continued kind of building of these trust relationships between government and the private sector which are not only about commercial realities but about real partnering on providing expertise and how do we grow together and, and how do we protect what we've built here in Europe. Mm. Thank you so much. So, Grisana, I saw you really nodding your head. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? You seem to be in agreement with what Andrew was saying. Uh, yes, I just, uh, I just... It'll it's, come. It's okay, okay. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, yes, it, it, because it's so, so true in terms of uh, how the race of public-private partnership, and I would say probably now we truly understand what it is, because we were speaking about public-private partnership a lot uh, and many times, yes, and now we see how it could work and how effective it could work. Uh, also, I uh, would add here about the cyber resilience, uh, how it's uh, what we see in Ukraine. It's impossible to, uh, to stand for the government itself. Uh, it's required to engage uh, the professional society, the professional groups, civil society, what we have done in Ukraine, we created a chatbot where every Ukrainian can authorize via mobile application DIA, which is actually in proof, yes, identity, so we know that it's Ukrainian citizen and um, it's possible to report, for example, Russian military uh, groups and any weapons, so with photo, video, or just text, and we have 300,000 people helping actually surveillance and military uh, army of Ukraine to get the information. And this is really useful uh, and tool which is uh, helpful and effective. And uh, also IT army, uh, this is a non-state actor, so it's not coordinated by the government, but they're sharing result and, um, and, and playing big role in terms of communication and fighting disinformation uh, was uh, in, in, in this war in cyberspace. So what is important and lesson we learned for now, it's impossible and not necessary actually to behold everything done by the government, by the agencies. It just needed to build the trust and partnership with a civil society, with a professional community, with a, with a business of course, and to make to have it transparent and and uh, common vision because now it uh, seems the only way. Thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to hear from Oleksandr Zivotovsky on this. Um, what do you think Europe can learn from Ukraine? What do I think Europe can learn from it? Well, you know, for once. We have our biggest war in Europe coming, you know, happening right now. And for all the discussions about the resilience networks, this is the live tests that we're here having here. And uh, as I said previously, uh, despite different forecasts, and uh, and uh, you know, we can now say that uh, we were given like from three to a week different intelligence agencies were forecasting, uh, you know, when the, our telecom infrastructure would be either destroyed or overrun. As of now, in, in the hundreds of days of war, about, the, as I said, 80% of infrastructure is up and running. And uh, we learned a lot, uh, a lot, uh, a lot uh, of different lessons, uh, sometimes funny, sometimes not. But this is our background, and, and this is the, the expertise that we are having now, having to learn now, and then we are happy, happy, happy to bring uh, bring it into into the uh, into the society that all, the whole country is uh, is fighting for for the inter European society, the expertise on security, on cyber security, on resilience of networks, on how do you keep up keep keep uh, the network the networks up even when, you know, 20% uh, of them are being physically destroyed. So, yeah, there is a lot of uh, things we learned in the past 100 days, and we are happy to share to share it, and, uh, and I think it would be beneficial to every, every you know, country in, in the European Union, because we all understand that this, this is war not about Ukraine, but about values. And, uh, and uh, yeah, this is. Uh, I think this is this is very important for everyone. Definitely. 
Um, well, thank you so much for that. So um, going back to you, uh, Jacek, uh, what do you think the long-term needs will be for IT specialists in Ukraine? And we've been talking a lot about collaboration, private, public. Um, how can both private and public sectors meet these needs? Sure. So maybe first I'll tell you how we look at digital uh, within the EBRD. So we look into three basic elements. So one is around foundation, the other one is about adaptation, and the third one is around innovation. No surprise that foundation is around being connect about connectivity, which is now actually one of the most important elements uh, uh, during this war to make sure that connectivity is happening. So a lot of investments will be around the uh, ICT sector to ensure that this uh, actually is being uh, fully, uh, fully operational, and that's what we are also looking to that. I was very happy to hear uh, so much about cybersecurity, because uh, the war in Ukraine also started the discussion within our organization, how we make sure we make our clients more cyber resilient, and that's when we came up with the product, which we called Cybersecurity Toolkit, which is really an advisory element to the clients in terms of assessment, penetration testing, or even doing the awareness raising, uh, mostly for small and medium-sized enterprise, about cybersecurity risks. And then you ask a very valid question, how are we going to rebuild the country? And if I were to have an answer for that, that would be uh, amazing. But I can give you some of the indications that what we think will be important. For, first of all, all of us sitting here on the screen have different talents, right? We have to create some kind of a system that brings all of those actors together that can actually benefit from the knowledge of each other and not duplicate the efforts. And I think that's really important um, side. Uh, secondly, the public-private sector element. Of course, there will be need for a big public sector donor money, and we're hearing loads of grants being declared by EU member states or, or the US, and that's fantastic. Uh, but on the other hand, there is also a need for, for a private sector. And what is interesting about the bank and what we do is, uh, in addition to investing, we also have teams that do donor fundraising. And uh, we, we raise a number of donor funds for Ukraine from the public sector, but we also uh, looking into a private sector with a special team and cooperating with many of the private sector companies and also with the European Commission to be able to deliver that money to the sectors that are in need with quite a targeted delivery and with a really high standards of, of the EBRD going through procedures, procurement, etc. So that's, uh, I hope, we become a bit of a vehicle that we could, we could use and then tech companies can also work with us on the projects and uh, investments. Thanks. So, Gulsana, you mentioned the workshop this morning. Um, could you share with us? I hear, I hear that it went really well, and I know you probably can't go into too many specifics, but what are the main takeaways from the workshop that you did this morning? Uh, probably it's how we handle the challenges um, uh, how we structure uh, the main important thing it's uh, I think we got all everyone got uh, it's sharing the information make it accessible and um, to document everything make it as a lessons to learn for uh, all the member states yes in the future generation so to align the policy and legal frameworks uh, we also uh, I would say the takeaway that it is inevitable that Ukrainian, Ukraine is doing its way to European Union, uh, and especially in digital sector, we're not only learning, yes, but we are bringing. And now we, what experience we have and knowledge and uh, expertise is also valuable and big input uh, to the European Union domain to make the digital Europe stronger. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds a little bit like what uh, Jakob was saying about collaboration, um, you know, making sure that everybody's working with the same elements and, and able to leverage that. Do you have anything else that you would like to add on that? I don't know if you were in this workshop, but um, it seems like there's a lot of great takeaways um, for Ukraine and for all of us. I couldn't, I couldn't unfortunately participate, but I want to pick up a bit the point that has been discussed in looking into the future and the Ukraine rightfully at this point of really devastating times, nevertheless looking into the future and how to, in a way, rebuild where they started off before that war with regard to digital transformation. And I believe there the challenge 
they face uh, or this country faces is is a bit the same as we do in Europe with regard to um, rolling out broadband and connectivity. And uh, I'm very glad to hear that 80% of the yeah. infrastructure is uh, still intact. Nevertheless, of course, buildings, houses are being destroyed and they need to be rebuilt. They need to be rebuilt with connectivity. And, uh, and the, fa the challenge that we face and that the European Commission is, is working on, uh, especially this year, is how to speed up network rollout, how to facilitate it. It's you know a bit ridiculous to talk about bureaucracy uh, in these given times, but that's exactly also a challenge that I'm sure also applies to the Ukraine, just like it applies to any other country, to be able that in the future networks will be rolled out you know, without long permit granting processes that um, telecoms equipment can, for example, use public buildings, rooftops, all of these measures um, are there to really speed up the digital transformation and, and um, make this, this motor connectivity um, um, for the future um, sustainable. And the second point, uh, a bit coming back to the, the fruitful cooperation that we're right now doing between Ukrainian operators and European operators, is, um, you know, I'm hearing there step by step the Ukraine is moving closer to be become a member of the European Union. And until then, I think, obviously, we need a, a longer-term solution um, also with regard to, to the um, uh, lowering of prices. And, and therefore, I think what we're doing right now, the voluntary commitments on both sides, the joint statement that is actually running, uh, uh, is absolutely um, important. And if you want to have a longer-term solution, we, I think, need to also talk about funding state aid. And I'm glad uh, already Commissioner Breton mentioned it uh, today that this is also uh, definitely necessary to, to continue these voluntary commitments that we're doing right now. Thank you so much. So um, I'd like to give each of you one minute, maximum one minute, um, to close and share any final statements that you'd like with the Digital Assembly here. The last word will obviously go to Ukraine, so we'll end with Alexander and Gursana, and you know we all really want to hear from uh, Ukraine on this, so uh, I'm counting on everybody to stay within the time limit, even go under. Um, maybe Angelika, we can start with you. Um, just one minute or less, final words on this. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, I think the re uh, reconstruction of the Ukraine will be a huge task, not only for the Ukraine, but also for the European Union and third countries. And I would like to have an answer, but I think uh, the Ukraine should concentrate on digitalization because this is the USP of the Ukraine. It contributed 4% uh, to GDP uh, before the war, and the Ukrainian and the European digital inter infrastructure are intertwined. And, uh, for example, the DA app could also be a best practice, uh, practice example for, for other member states. And I think the Ukraine should also concentrate on the Green Deal, not only because of the areas for photovoltaic and wind turbines, but also, honestly, we all know the Green Deal cannot fly without digitalization, without innovation and research and development. And the third one, the war shows also that the nutrition supply is very important, and I think, therefore, keep and rebuild a strong architectural sector by incorporating the digital sector. And last but not least, uh, yes, uh, we, I think we need a, a common strategy for with the Ukraine uh, concerning the important natural resources because digitalization and Green Deal uh, needs a lot of natural resources. Thank you. Thank you for that, Angelika. Pavel, can we hear your closing comments? of war, uh, 4 million people uh, crossed the border in Poland, 4 million refugees entered to Poland, and 3,2 million of them decided to stay. So we had to find a way, we as the Polish authorities, we had to find a way, uh, how to, the way to include them into our social care system, healthcare system, educational system, etc., etc. And therefore, we decided to give them the personal ID numbers uh, similar and actually identical to those possessed by Polish citizens. 
and we let them have uh, M Obivatel app, 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 which uh, is a, a M mobile citizen. It seems we've lost you, but we're going to keep moving on because uh, time is pressing. Andrew, what would you like to leave us with really quickly? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's, it's very important to think about the future, uh, of course, and, and this is something that, that we should do, and we should think about how are we going to make sure that as we see the world transforming because of digitization, that it transforms us in a, in, in a way that we, that we would like, uh, and that we, in the way that our citizens will be, um, have their privacy protected, that their, their, their security, physical and uh, digital protected, and that we can, we can use digital transformation to improve the lives of citizens, and without, without thinking about how we invest in, in the cybersecurity fundamentals that underpin everything that we do in digital technology, uh, I think that that aim will be much harder to achieve. Uh, so I would very much uh, encourage all of us to think about not, and it's not about buying a product and forgetting about it, cybersecurity practice is, it is a practice, it's something that evolves and it moves, but to think about the fundamentals of how we design systems, how we integrate systems, how we work with each other across borders so that incidents like NotPetya doesn't take down half of the world because of one country being targeted. Uh, these are all important questions and that they must all be answered by, I, I think it must be answered by us in, 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 let's say, digital democracies as well, so that these technologies are used for the benefit of, of citizens. Slava Ukraine. Thank you so much, Jakob. I think we learned today that uh, connectivity is, is really the, the basis and the motor that drives digital transformation. Um, and it has been pivotal in those past weeks uh, and months uh, to get uh, to keep everybody connected. And um, I can only um, reassure again uh, our commitment um, to cooperate with the Ukrainian operators to facilitate, to ease communications uh, in the weeks to come. And, uh, and uh, I thank, again, the, the European Commission uh, for coordinating these efforts. And, uh, again, also thanks um, to, to all the pledges that we've seen today by all the operators. Thank you. Jacek. So we all talk about uh, digital dividend, which is uh, so important. I think absolutely that's the future. But I think we should be smart about it so we do not increase any digital divide and exclude others from technology, because not everyone may be there. So how are we able to create that digital dividend and invest in digital without excluding uh, others, whether that's the age population group or actually uh, located in the remote rural areas, which again, the connectivity element is important. Thank you so much. Let's go to uh, Alexander, who's still with us. Um, what last words would you like to leave us with? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you three points. First point is uh, we Ukrainians consider ourselves as a part of Europe, and the war that rages on is, is as I said, is, is not about you know the territory; it is about values for us at least. Second point is the digital infrastructure, telecom infrastructure, is the key to freedom, to freedom of speech, to freedom of election, to free, uh, to access to freedom to access information and so on and so forth. So that gives us the third point, is that uh, I'm very grateful for this event. Thank you very much for having us here. I think this is, uh, you know, very beneficial as much for Ukraine, so as much for Europe, to rebuild the, the digital infrastructure in Ukraine, because this is the key to freedom, and this is the key to what we are fighting for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gulsana, would you like to close this panel? Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, from one point it's hard to to close because uh, there were so many important things said uh, here. I just want to say that precisely today is 117 day of war, and it was possible to stand so long. Uh, I mean, from the assessment, yes, that were uh, given to Ukraine before, uh, only with the support and uh, the strength and the braveness that we all have shown in our unity. And uh, 
what we are doing now exactly, we are planning our future. We are planning how we can restore what we should do to uh, Ukraine to recover and rebuild. And it's a good chance and actually a good opportunity uh, because now it's not a matter, like we know that we will win this war. It's just a matter of time. And uh, so now it's a great time to be bold in your ideas and um, to realize all potential the business and government have and to be brave and support each other. So uh, that's what we are standing for. And we really believe that transformation and recovery of Ukraine is possible. We are digital, uh, digital economy, and um, we are already planning and let all partners be with us in this way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Slava Ukraini. And, I'm Slava. Um, and uh, yeah, just what a great message to end this with. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for being here. Thanks for everybody on our panel. That wraps up um, our first day. So I just really want to thank you guys for that um, before we jump into our next session. Thank you. So as this first uh, day comes to a close, we have um, a video for you guys. Um, it's about the digitalization of Ukraine's cultural heritage. Um, you may have already seen there's an exhibit in the entrance of the building, um, and we are also showing films in the Saint-Exupéry room um, that you should definitely check out both of those exhibits. Um, so to give you a little bit more context, in 2019, 27 European countries signed the Declaration on Cooperation on Advancing the Digitalization of Cultural Heritage. And they did this because cultural heritage is facing so many risks, like natural hazards, pollution, and just time-related deterioration. Um, just a few days later, uh, not very ironically, Notre Dame in Paris caught fire. So it was this reminder and urgency that we really need to digitize our heritage before it's gone. And in Ukraine, I'm sure you can imagine the damage the war is having on their cultural heritage. Since the invasion of Ukraine, 3.6 monuments have been destroyed every day. So there's the Save the Ukraine Monuments Initiative. You've seen um, maybe their logos or, or some of their work. They are working tirelessly to make sure that the memory of those monuments is not lost. They have secured precious cultural assets by transferring them to safe European data centers across the EU. So we have a video to show you a little bit more of their work. Let's check this out. Immediately after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, 4CH, the European Competence Center for the Conservation of Cultural Heritage, launched an initiative to save the digital documentation of Ukrainian cultural heritage, fearing that it might be destroyed, as indeed is sadly happening. Descriptions, photos, and 3D models will enable the restoration or reconstruction of buildings and monuments damaged by the war. The initiative has been agreed upon with the Ukrainian authorities and strongly supported by the European Commission. Fearing that together with the monuments themselves, their digital documentation also might be damaged or lost, vast amounts of digital resources have been mobilized to store copies of such files on secure servers in the European Union, where Ukrainian colleagues can transfer documents via internet copies, which will be returned to them when peace will come back. So far, complete or ongoing saved files include more than 100 terabytes of data a volume equivalent to 25 million high-resolution photos or 25,000 movies. Truly a Netflix of the Ukrainian cultural heritage. The rescue operation continues. So in closing uh, this first day of the Digital Assembly, we have one last surprise for you guys, and I won't spoil it or give any information. It speaks for itself. Ukraine is a chance for you, for your companies, your technologies, knowledge, expertise, and investments. All of these can show their value and do it in Ukraine. This is why, that is why we offer the digital land lease. 
in the coming weeks at a conference in Lugana, Switzerland, dedicated to the reconstruction of Ukraine, we will set out the details of this plan and write. After this conference, you can also join the digital revolution in Ukraine, in Europe and in the world through our state platform, United24. We are launching a major digital initiative, Digital for Freedom. Everyone will be able to contribute to the development of digital infrastructure the way you like. Building new history together. Building new Ukraine together, free, brave, and digital. Thank you and glory to Ukraine. concludes the first day of this digital assembly, um, but it's not all the way over. We invite you to join us for the networking and the cocktail in the Caravelle room, which is on the ground floor. And if you're staying with us in Toulouse tonight, uh, we hope you enjoy la Fête de la Musique, uh, National uh, Music uh, Day. Thank you so much, and we'll see you here tomorrow.